This week's episode is sponsored by Ryan at Change. If you are looking to get involved in e-commerce and build a successful online business, then check out my good friend Ryan, who I have been working with the last few years and attended many events and retreats all around the world, spending time with members who are making some serious money. I have been promoting Ryan for a while now because I believe in what he does and not only has he helped and supported me build my own businesses, but I have seen firsthand how he helps and supports his members take their businesses to new levels and give them financial freedom. So if you are interested in getting into e-commerce and building successful online stores, then message Ryan on his Instagram at RyanJB to join his winning team. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Dwayne Patterson. Dwayne, how are we? Yeah, I'm okay, you know. And um, thank you for allowing me the opportunity as well. I would just like to say as well, first and foremost is, assalamu alaikum to my um, Muslim brothers and peace and universal love for the rest of humanity and for the rest of my friends as well. Mm-hmm. I would also like to say as well, I'd like to thank you. I would like to um, thank Christian from RTN and I would like to um, thank Young Spray as well. You were the three that kind of reached out to me when nobody really wanted to touch me because it was kind of like, I was like a taboo subject. So I'd just like to thank you as well of Anything. actually being dedicated. You're a man who a lot of people would be surprised that you're saying thank you and uh, speaking religion from a man who's done double shootings, who spent nearly 30 years in prison, from a man who was wild back in the day to then trying to make changes. You're out now after... Nearly 24 years, like, it's a long time. Things have changed just over the last five years, never mind 20. So it's good that you're actually sitting here now, seeing the world a bit differently. But before we get into all the nitty gritty, let's go right back to the start, just to get a bit of understanding about you, where you grew up and how it all began. Okay, so I actually grew up in um, South London. I originally come from Clapham Junction. Then um, <clears throat> eventually from Clapham Junction, I actually moved to Wandsworth Road. So that is actually Patmore Estate. What were you like at school? Uh, to be fair, um, what the teachers say and from what the records actually state as well, they said that I was highly intelligent. But one of the problems that I was always succumbing to was this, um, <clears throat> my ability sometimes not to get along with other children. So I was constantly in fights. Now, now looking back, I understood the reasons why I got into so many fights as well. I was always a person as well that I always had a sense of, <clears throat> do you know, like um, justice. So when I believed that there was levels of social injustices, I felt that I needed to talk out against that, if that makes sense. And so um, I think that was some of the problems that actually occurred. What about family life? Mum, dad, brothers, sisters? Oh yeah, it was nice. My parents, my parents had me at a young age. So um, I lived obviously with my mum, but she was at still school age. So I was with my grandmother. My grand, you know, in the Caribbean culture as well, your grandmother is kind of like the matriarch. And yeah, my father as well was young as well. My grandparents again, the grandmother, matriarch. It was good. My father, he had a company in painting and decorating. And my mother was a seamstress and she worked in central London. So I can't say that I was dragged up. I have nine, I have nine sisters and five brothers. None of them has ever been in trouble with the law. So, um, you made up for that. <laughs> you made up for it, bro. I, I don't really think so. I, I know where it started though. You know, like sometimes when you, you know, you converse with many individuals and, they sometimes struggle to understand where the trigger point was. 
for me, I knew, I knew where the catalyst was. What was that? Um, when I was roughly about 10 years of age, my mum used to, I moved to Patmore. And at the time I didn't know, there was kind of like little rivalries because Patmore at the time when I was younger, it was like Switzerland. So you would have many other estates that would actually come into Patmore itself. So you would have like people from Brixton, Stockwell, they all seemed to get along. But for some reason, they had a aversion for Clapham Junction. And I was originally from Clapham Junction. So what actually happened was um, there was a group of, you know, other young kids that didn't like me. And I would always try to find ways of avoiding, avoiding them. So unfortunately, one day um, they spotted me. They asked me to relinquish my jacket. I refused and I ended up being set, set upon. At the time, I never understood because I've always seen adults as being protectors. So when I was screaming for help, no one was helping. But being an adult now, I can understand that some adults were probably scared because there were so many, there were so many young people involved. They probably didn't want to get injured and hurt and so forth and the way society is. But at that time, you see them as the protectors and they're not helping you. So when my mom took me to the hospital, I turned around and I said to my mom, it will never happen to me again. And that was the catalyst for things to start. So in my time, especially, we were always told to, you go for the biggest one, you go for the ringleader. So obviously I approached that, the person who I considered to be the ringleader with a rounders bat. And then from there, um, it altered. It, al it altered my life in that sense. I gained the respect of the estate and then I went on to neighboring estates and I used to just constantly fight. How was that feeling the first time you gave someone <clears throat> a bit of violence back? To be fair, um, <clears throat> even though I was young and I had a primitive way of thinking, I look back now and I realized that that allowed me then to develop an appetite for blood. So I thought, okay, so this is how I can get my message across. This is how you communicate. So I communicated with um, extreme violence. Did you feel as if you were taking control or did you feel out of control? Um, I felt both. So sometimes, obviously, you feel that you're in control of a situation, but sometimes you can feel out of control of a situation as well because how it leads you into but yeah, I just felt that I needed to make a stance. As what we say, I'd rather, you know, die on my feet than live on my knees. And I had enough. You know, they call it the fight and flight syndrome, but there's also freeze. So I knew, I knew by flight, it would just prolong my suffering. I knew that freeze, I'd just become an easy target. So I knew I only had one option and that was the actual fight. When did it start getting out of control? From using a rounders bat to then using tools to then using blades, <clears throat> what age? I think um, so. I would rough. I would roughly say maybe about twelve. Still young. Still young. Yeah. So now kids have. I think they were like butterfly knives and little lock knives and yeah, things such backs. as that. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I think it developed, I think it developed in that way that then obviously I need to level up. So how do you level up? By carrying what they're, they are also carrying, making sure that I don't become that victim again, being stumped upon, being kicked upon, calling for help and there's nobody to help. I saw that the world was a very cruel place and only the strong survive. It was survival of the fittest, which now as being an adult, I know it's just a, mere justification for destroying and oppressing people much weaker than ourselves. But at that time, I didn't see it like that. When did you, you done a five stretch? Was it the YOs you went to or Boston? What was it you done? Yeah, so um, I was I was a bit too young because it was a sensitive case. So obviously I amputated another young kid's finger. So um, <clears throat> I, w I went to secure units first. So I went to Stamford House, I went to Orchard Lodge, and I also went to Vinnie Green. 
But because of my behavior, again, it's always history repeating itself with my fights and everything. As soon as I hit 15, they were happy and relieved. Now you're going to Felton. So that was kind of, that was kind of the pattern. What was it like chopping someone's finger off? <clears throat> to be fair, being so young, because I was 13, it's, you're not understanding, you're not understanding the magnitude of what you've actually done. Now looking back, especially as an adult as well, it's a parent's worst nightmare. I'm not a parent, but I'm an uncle. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm an older brother and so forth. And it's just horrendous that, but unfortunately, being young, you don't sometimes actually, how can I, how can I articulate this? See the repercussions. It's something that my father always said to me. He said, his son, it's not the mistakes that you have to worry about, but it's the consequences that come with the mistakes. What was the reason for chopping the finger off? So with this, again, it comes down to groups dynamics and not liking the particular group. I can't say per se that that young person done anything directly towards me, but it was just the whole of who he was connected with, I didn't like. So I was just making a statement and it's, it's bad, it's horrendous. And my heart goes out to, you know, the young person, grown man now and um, his family and so forth. And I hope I don't, you know, reinvoke any feelings from yeah. talking about this. Yeah, fair so. play. Obviously, you've changed your whole outlook in life, the way you see things, the mistakes <clears throat> that you've done. But obviously, it's, it might, might be difficult speaking about it because you don't want to be in here. We're not glorifying it, but mm. it's still your story for people to understand the shit that you were actually involved in to the shit that you're actually doing now, the way you speak, the way you present yourself, that people can change. So when you end up getting a five, like, what was that feeling when you end up getting put in the secure unit at 12, 13? Oh, wow. Well, um... I was surprised. The whole kind of dynamics was different. Like, again, this was like, it felt like another failure for me again, because you always look at adults as being kind, being generous, um, being your protectors. But I saw a lot of them actually being abusers. For example, as well, we know that sometimes children can be mischievous, but what they actually, how they actually resolve situations as well was by punching you in your stomach, twisting your arm back, so like, like, you know, it, it almost seemed like, it was like sadomasochist. Like they wanted you to feel pain just for you to scream and so forth. They were getting like a thrill out of, out of pulling your neck back and so forth. And you're a child, technically you're a child, you're a kid. So I then realized that nobody really cares. So I'm not going to care. So I hardened to that notion. So that fueled your fire? 101%. What was the other kids like you were with? Did you see the fear in them? Or was everybody kind of lost little souls? That's how I saw it. I saw that everybody was trying to play their position on the field. Everyone was trying to, <clears throat> you know, somebody, everyone was trying to become someone. And they thought by becoming that, you know, becoming a person was by implementing extreme violence or being aggressive. Because when you're younger, that's what you look to. And I always remember, I always used to see, because it was funny. I used to have this weird relationship with my father when I was younger. I never really understood my father's methods. I used to think he was soft because he was so calm. Like, for example, if we had to, if he took me to the school, like, so there's an instant. So the parents are there, my father, my parents are there, my mother, my father. And the parents are irated. So sometimes, as you know, because the other parent's son has lost, now the father wants to take it upon himself. Like, why don't me and you have one? And my father was always calm. And I remember once what he said to, um, <clears throat> he said to one gentleman as well. He says, sir, I don't want to fight you. Why, why do we want to fight for? We know how temperamental children are. They will fight today, but they'll be friends tomorrow. How silly would we be if we went outside now and was rolling up and down? And at that time, I, I saw it now, I see him as a great diffuser. But at that time, I thought, no, he should be like my other friend's father that just punches people in the mouth and, you know, he just resolves situations like that. But now, at this age, no disrespect to my friend, seeing his father now that has gone in and out of prison, got no stable job, um, and, you know, the kids are not even respecting him no more because they're saying that, listen, you're an old guy. You're tr you, we're not listening to you. So now you can see and where that my father's got respect. People still acknowledge my father. 
my father's almost, um, he's been sick, he's been ill, and he's almost died three times. And so many people has been to his bedside because of the amount of love that he's generated. Mm -hmm. So it just goes to show. So then I said, I want to implement those steps as well. Just be a nice person. Yeah, the peaceful man's a strong man. The peaceful man's a warrior. But you grew up in an environment where you think people shouting, using tools, shooting, stabbings. You think, that I want to be like them, not realising it's the weak man. The angry man's the weak man. The angry one's the soft one because they're battling the bullier. The people who destroy lives and bully lives so they're, they're because they're broken. It's not necessarily they're bad people. They just mm. do bad shit because they feel as if it protects them from people seeing right through who they are. 100%. And this is, it happens through the whole wide world. They're like, it's fucking mad that people full of rage and anger is a, it's a, it's a weakness that people have and triggers that, that people are easily manipulated to then push to do bad stuff, even though it's just making them worse because the conscience mind is a powerful tool. The brain is such a powerful tool when you do bad shit, no matter how tough we think we are, it will fucking surprise us in 10, 20, 50 years. It will throw every emotion that you've blocked and, and not faced. And then that's when it comes to the head. I had an undercover copper on just before you came in. Very strong man, done his job, um, but blocked all his pain and abuse out as a kid. And then in ages in his 50s, he ended up in nervous breakdown, ended up in a mental institute, white padded cell, because he'd blocked out all his feelings and emotions. And as men, that's why we struggle. We don't speak. And you don't we bottle percent. shit out. We pretend. I always say it with the great pretenders. We all yeah. act, a gate will act as if we are something, but nobody sees us at night when we're scared, alone, pretending. It's fucking mad. So you're in there. What's the worst thing you've seen while you're going through the kind of YOs? Oh, so <clears throat> uh, YOs. I think I wouldn't really. I think later on in years when I can actually describe some of the worst things, but I think it was just lots of fights. I think it was just ruthless. Like um, some people are being terrorized like throughout their whole sentence. And I just thought that it's not going to be me. And I understood it was the way I, the way I actually describe young offenders, it was like a baby fight club. So baby fight club in the sense of that, you know, Sometimes the those that had the duty of care also encouraged you to also resolve situations by extreme violence. So what actually happens is that you become conditioned to that way of thinking. And then you're thinking that it's okay once you're out that way. If somebody says something rude, then all I can do is just punch him in his face because you've been conditioned to think that way. Because lots of people pose a question to me, but you, uh, you know, this is your second time of incarceration, the first time, so you didn't. Clearly, you've not learned. But what they failed to understand as well, that the first time, especially in the early 90s as well, there was no such thing as rehabilitative courses. It was based on do your time. It's like the Victorian era. Do your time and then you're back out. And especially being so young, you were conditioned. I remember they used to allow you to go to the gym and have fights and punch ups. And they used to say, yeah, who'd you put? Even the officers were putting their little bets on, oh, who's going to win? So you grew up hardened. You grew up mind condition in that sense okay so this is how i'm going to resolve a situation yeah that's child abuse that's child abuse like that's why the system's fucked they don't help people there's people are straight back in because it's all they know there's no really a lot of people can come out and change a prime example but the majority end up back in it's like over 80 percent and that's the sad thing because like i say they're not bad they just do bad shit because it's all they fucking know once you actually can get that role model or that bit of inspiration, you go, well, if he can change, I can change. And that's what it's all about, is leaving the footprints for people to then follow and go, I'm going to do the same. There's not enough inspiration for me. I totally concur. So you ended up doing five. St what age did you get out? 18. <clears throat> so you done the full five? Is that because yeah. of the violence in there? <clears throat> um, no, it was sensitive. I got convicted at 15. I got convicted at 90, um, in 95, which they, they gave me a five years, but that was extreme. If you really think about it, considering my age, considering the time, I actually got five. Mm -hmm. Then I'm um, taking on consideration the amount of time that I had done, but I sconded. So what happened was when I was in Stamford, when I was in Stamford House, I went in the secure part at first. I was in the kind of open part of Stamford House, which I then sconded. I was on the, what people might articulate on the run for about three months or so, maybe a few months. I can't really calculate it during that time 
I also committed another offence whilst they were l looking for me, which was, at the time, I think they call it now, the technical word now, they called it steaming. But at the time, we called it shabby in the abbey. So that was a group of kids. You would jump over like a building society, jump over the counters and stuff as much money down your trousers and so forth as you can and basically run out. I got also, I got three and a half years to run concurrent with my five years. Uh -huh. so. What was it like coming out? Did you feel you were a man? Did you feel you were getting respect because you had that violence in you? No, it was, it was actually weird because you have to also remember prior before that, I was used to being around my mother. Like, you know, mother and father, they sign, you know, they, they are your guardian. So they take you places. Now they say that I'm actually, I'm actually a young adult. So I have to do it myself, like filling out forms. And it was, <clears throat> yeah, so it was strange. It, it is a massive gulf for a young person and coming out and the world has kind of changed. And I just felt, it felt, it felt awkward. But the thing that upset me the most was that um, how I perceived that society don't, doesn't really give you a second chance. Because what actually happened was, which was my trigger point in me continuing um, or moving in different degrees of dysfunctional behavior was I was applying for bank accounts. So obviously I knew that that was the thing. I've never had, up till now, I've never had a, a, a debit card or credit card. So the first time out, they basically, they basically um, denied me. And I was thinking, and I remember the time when I got arrested for the steaming that they believed that I've done so many and I've actually got away with it. So they wanted me to do something called like, they call it clear, clear up. So you would just point them in the right, point them in the right direction of like some of the other crimes, other the building societies and things that you've done. And they can put that down. They can mark it down as solved cases. But I said, no, I'm not doing that. So when I came out, the backlash of the banks and so forth, I wouldn't get in no account. They would just all deny me. So I remember once having a conversation with my father and he was like, son, just take your time. He's got a very soft voice. And he was like, son, take your time. Just in due course. I'm thinking, I'm not listening to that. <laughs> <laughs> I am definitely not listening to that. So then I just continued. I I, I just said, you know what? Um, the uh, battle lines have been drawn. This is it. I'm going all out. How was that for your mum and dad? Your dad, soft spoken, kind of leads by example by his presence, not realizing that was a strength. But how was that when your mum and dad are coming to visit you? Did you just block all that out? Where? you knew you were letting them down and breaking their heart because nobody else in the family was causing trouble. Yeah, especially my mother. It's, it's, it's different. We can, we, can, we can talk about fathers as well. And I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to underestimate the power of the love that a father has for his child. But you can, we can never imagine from a, from a female's perspective as well, you carry a child for nine months. You give birth to that child. You, you have the very best intentions for that child. You try to provide the best that you can for that child. And all that child is doing is just causing you heartache and pain. So for me, definitely, that still haunts me. Yeah, because people need to realise, I believe women are the centre of the universe. The, the, uni the world, the universe, whatever it is, revolves around women. The way they carry a child, the way their energy changes, the way they can feed the baby, the way they this nutrients and stem cells come for the umbilical cord that's fucking mind blown how listen you need, men and women need each other men 100%. need to be masculine of course we need to provide and protect but women need to nurture women need to show love and because men are sensitive men don't know how to love I still don't know if I've ever been in love and that's fucked up and I've had many relationships you know what I mean I've got kids but I don't know what the feeling is to truly feel fucking love and it's the most purest form of anything on this planet and that's why a, a woman and a, a child don't have the purest form of love mm. men we're we're weird beings we're very i don't know we're pretty fucking we're pretty easy as well we're pretty fucking mm. but we're still confused men i've interviewed so many people nobody knows what the fuck is happening i'm glad that you said that though because look first and foremost is this is not a religious sermon 
Mm-hmm. But I'm glad that you actually mentioned this and you touched upon this because in my Quran, I actually read it as well. It says men were created weak. So sometimes we consider strength because of our physical abilities for things. But what about mentally? What about spiritually? So you are correct as well. We are. We were created weak. Yeah, look when a man gets a flu. I think the fucking the world is, is over. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? The mental health <laughs> is through the roof. What does that tell you about women? They're stronger. No, 100%. And Jordan Peterson used to say, oh, and I thought it was amazing when he says that he, Jordan Peterson says, um, the majority of men are in prison, the majority of men are homeless, the majority of men work in building sites, the majority of men are suicidal, the majority of men fighting wars, the majority of men are in prison. What does that tell you about women? It means women are smarter. Mm. They don't fucking do that shit. Mm. We, we choose to do it. We don't need to do it either. So that tells you that men make bad choices and women make better choices, in my own opinion. No, you're right. And because it's, uh, I just think the world is confused. I think everybody's angry, angry at each other, feminine and masculine. Men are feminine as well. The men need the masculine energy. We do need to lead by the front. Men build the world. Women create it. Mm, I agree. So you get out. What are you thinking then? Is it just straight back to business, violence? So obviously there's a whole different shift. So now the whole dynamics change. So you know when sometimes, you know, I've listened to some of your podcasts as well. And no disrespect to anybody, I'm not here to criticize anyone. But you know, sometimes they, I call them raconteurs, skilled storytellers, in the sense of that, yeah, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I stepped back out and then all of a sudden everybody was around me and I was that man. It doesn't work like that. As you know already, you know I'm good friends with Lou and so forth. Yeah, sure, and, Lou Clark as well. And yeah, of course, definitely, 101%. And that whole dynamic, so their age group, do you honestly think that as much as they may have respect for me, that I can just come out and just thinking that, yeah, well, you lot are going to be working for me and this and that. It's not going to happen. I'll end up a victim very quickly. So the whole dynamics has changed. So what I needed to do was, is understand the whole kind of dynamics again. Okay, so what role, where's my positioning? And then from there. So um, I realized that the group's dynamics have changed now. People have got older, they're accumulating more money. So the groups are smaller now. The only time that you're in large groups is that you're showing off your wealth. So in the sense of that, if you're going to the Coliseum, if you're going partying and so forth, then everyone will meet up. People will have nice cars, jewelry and so forth. But usually your core group of the day and the people that you're usually conspiring with are very small groups. And then basically from there, um, I also understood that dynamics have changed as well. Like for example, it, before it was fist fights, but now it's a spaghetti western. Who draws first wins? So they're saying that, wait there, you're bringing your fist to a gunfight. <laughs> they're laughing at you. So you need to level up. So then I thought, okay, I'm going to go and get myself one. And so that's how things starts. Why did you become so calculated, figuring out your move and your position? I didn't even see it like that. I saw it as survival. I thought if you, if you snooze, you lose. It was just like, I saw things, I saw things at the time as chess boxing. So what we mean by chess boxing, if you look at the position of a chess board as well, you will actually see like um, offensive, defensive. So offensive is plan action of, a, um, of attack and defensive is resistance to attack. And I had enough of being in a defensive position. I wanted to be in an offensive position. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So this is what we said that, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I mean, is that when you leveled up then? Started going to the series stuff? Yeah, that's, the shooters. that's correct, yes. And uh, how long were you out for? For the five p- five years to the 20-odd the years? Just just two years. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing because it is fucked up, isn't it? It's, uh, yeah. Just, just two <laughs> and years. And how was life like? What age were you then? 18, um, 19? I was, I was 20. So yeah, all my kind of criminal activities, I was 18, 19, 20. I'm back in prison. Yeah. Did anybody ever say to you, listen, get your shit together? At that age, you never listen anyway, but was there anybody, any of your olders, any uncles? Um, yeah, I've had, I've had a lot. Like my, my uncle, my uncle Ozzy, my uncle, my uncle Floyd, my aunties, you know, <laughs> it was, there were so many people. It's like, they've all, I've, I've lived with all, I've at one, at one stage in my life, I've lived with all my um, uncles and aunties and so forth. Even my auntie Adrena. I lived in Croydon and I was with 
I was living in um, the same room as my cousin Smurf and so forth. So growing up there and so everybody played a part in trying to help me. And I can't, that's one thing that I can't criticize my family. And sometimes I feel remorseful as well, because I felt that I've taken a lot from my siblings as well, because everybody was so focused on me, even my cousins as well. I have to apologize because everybody was focused on helping me even my uncles and aunties, which is very strange. Like with most people, how the world, how the, how, how the world is today, it weren't like that in my times. It was just, it took a village to raise a child, even friends of family, even friends and family and so forth. So. How do you think if you grew up in another place, do you think it would have been different? Or do you think you always had that in you? I think I always had that in me. I, I tell you the reasons why. My siblings came from the same place. They never, they've gone through certain trials and tribulations. It's, it's how you interpret a situation. And it's funny that you mentioned that as well, because when I was also studying in prison as well, social science, do my degree, I, re I remember that there was a study on regards to two brothers. And if my memory serves me correctly, I think they might've been twins. Yeah, the dad was an alcoholic. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One, and, be, one became an alcoholic, one never touched it because he hated the smell of it. That's correct. Yeah, I spoke about that last podcast, actually. <laughs> that's so strange, yeah. So it comes down to how you interpret a situation as well. And for me, it, it just always came back to being that victim, not allowing that to happen. And I just, I don't know. It, it's a horrible feeling not being in control. Being in control in the sense of somebody else is di dictating for you. So they're saying that we can do, we, we feel that we can do what we want to do to you at any time. And there's nobody, but there's nobody to help you. Even though you thought that you were safe because you was amongst adults, we're letting you know that you're not safe. So I said that, okay, I need to protect myself. Has that become, is that ego or pride? Mm. I think at that age, at that time, I would say it was protection. But now, now at this age, of course, because we know that being adults and our minds are developed as well, there's definitely 101% different alternatives as well of resolving situations. So the two years you were out, what were you like then? Were you like a loose cannon? Yeah, very. Um, Do you think it was only a matter of time before you ended up dead or in prison anyway? 100%. And it was kind of sad as well because me and my father had a heart to heart. And he said, son, there was only two ways you was going to go. And I... And I said, and he said, look, I'm sorry. I'm going to say something to you. And my prayer came correct. It was either death or imprisonment. And God loved you and he gave you imprisonment. Saved your life? And I say, God saved my life. Yeah. But yes. Yeah, that's, yeah. But it's <laughs> strange. So the night it all changed then, you've got a shooter and you've blasted two guys. Like, what was the, what was the yeah. thought process um, that night? Was that a lead up to something or was it just instinct? And that was leading up. We lived, uh, we need to be honest here as well. See, one thing that I've always learned as well, and I've been taught as well, we speak the truth even if it's against ourselves as well. We were predators. So obviously, the way that we looked at things as well, why would society care for when they're also involved in what we're involved in? So it doesn't matter. We're not, help we're not hurting civilians. This is what we've all signed up to. This is an occupational hazard. So the way that when I got the phone call and I said that these individuals were dealing with illegal activity, allegedly, my, um, obviously my, my protocol was, okay, we're going to go and obtain what they have and they can't say nothing about it because they're also involved in what we're involved in. But then, I don't know, it's this kind of warped this warped understanding that we also have. And one of the, I know this might be alarming to the public as well, what I'm going to say next. We had a system in place as well that if you show your gun, you use it. There's no point in talking about something and waving it around if you're not going to use it. So that's what I basically done. I produced the firearm and I shot them both. And I thank God that they survived. But because of the severity, um, basically of the shooting, I was given, I know we're going to get to that. But um, <clears throat> there was a lot of other, it weren't 
planned properly because we weren't expecting the backlash in that sense. Again, is what I said to you, you know, criminal against criminal, you expect a certain code of conduct, you know, you expect there's going to be maybe a swift repercussion, but not actually, as what we say, becoming a stool pigeon or, you know, talking to the boys in blue. But the whole dynamics as society and times have changed as well and people don't really... And then there was other aspects as well that other innocent people were getting actually dragged into it. So eventually I handed myself in after a few days. I handed myself in and then from there, um, I was given a discretionary life sentence. It seems a bit harsh for to attempt murders, but again, I, the system was a bit <laughs> fucked. Um, so that night you're saying, if you've got a gun, you've got to use it, basically you're a pussy. Did you feel that pressure? Straight away, if, if everything that you've done in your life doesn't really mean anything because people then think I'm a coward and then you feel that emotion you felt at 10 years old, so you had to use it? No, I was, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to speak the truth here. I was yeah, desensitized. I didn't really care. Mm -hmm. So it was one of those. Um, we say to ourselves already, you see how the human mind works as well. It, it works by justification. We justify things. So it makes it easy for us. For example, as well, they are criminals. They also do bad things. So who cares? In our community, you need a, you need a villain and you need a hero. I don't mind being that villain because I don't care because these people are also up to no good. So that's how we condition our minds in doing the things that we do. So once you've done that, you can then go and have a burger and chips and so forth and you feel no way. It's different. It's different if it's a civilian gets hit or innocent person or a child gets hit and so forth, then obviously. But when it's somebody that has signed up what you claim to sign up, but not understanding the ramifications, the effect that you're going to have not only on that victim, but their families. Um, they're also just trying to survive in this concrete jungle as well. What gives you the right to even try to take that person's life because you're thinking that they're doing something wrong? And even if they're doing something wrong, does it justify the level of violence, the suppression, oppression and depression that mm -hmm. one's implementing? So, yeah. And um, the ripple effect that it has. It's like a soldier going to war, killing people. There's women, women, children, men getting killed. And you'll hear them, listen, there's so, there's, it's just the way, there shouldn't be wars. All war is murder in my eyes, but it's just the way the world works. There is soldiers, and that's just the way whoever controls it can manipulate the masses to then go and do something. Did you feel as if that was your mindset, that it was your duty because it's criminal v criminal? Everybody had signed up for that, so it made it easier? Yeah, definitely. And we're fledgling, we're fl fledgling, um, fledglings. So what we're... We're trying to make our mark in the world as well. You know, let's be honest here, because I'm not going to hear spin you a tell as well to say that I was this multi-millionaire, I was doing this. No, how could I be when I was 18 years of age? You're just starting off. <laughs> let's be honest. But we done well, considering our age group and what we were doing. But we were still young. There was much established other gentlemen at the time, but people still respected, and especially the particular estate and Wandsworth Road and there's hundreds of estates and the kind of connecting the dots and so forth. But yeah, we were, we were young. Sometimes as well, being so young, you have that high levels of testosterone. Um, you, you have this um, inflated, protective layer on, you know, it's not a true reflection because you're young, you know, you don't really think you're more reactive and you don't understand fully the repercussions, which what, I'm going to. What gun was that? Um, uh, I think it was a 357, if I can, if my memory serves me correctly. And what was the feeling like after you'd shot two people? Again, were you just numb to it? Just one of those things that we getting a burger and chips and just shot off? It is because when you live the particular lifestyle, Remember, I was out for two years. So when you're living a particular lifestyle and you become accustomed to a certain way of life as well, you get desensitized. Why did you hand yourself in? Um, there was a few things. There was also a young lady. Um, she was no way connected. I'm going to say this again. But she was also taken into the police station as well. And um, I must admit, though, I have to congratulate her as well because she, she stood firm in that sense, but they were threatening her and because she had a, 
you know, she's got a child and everything else as well. Um, <clears throat> then I was the person that I was with, I was deceived by that person as well. And, um, yeah, we'll just say that he went into things as well, which see, this is the thing that a lot of young people have to also understand as well, that sometimes the person that you think is your friend and you know, you may throw yourself in front of a bullet for might not necessarily be your friend when as what some people say when um situations intensify so i think this is a thing for young people to also reflect on as well and it goes to show again women are stronger than men that woman never broke she was not probably said yeah, you're going to lose your son yeah. you're going to prison never broke but yet the fucking the man who you're standing next to who you take a bullet for who you potentially try to kill people for his ass has went no loyalty in that game especially from men and that's why i always say women are stronger because they see the world differently we feel a shit great pretenders talk pish <laughs> it's mad mm. no, you're so right. you you hand yourself in when did you realize they weren't dead so you must be thinking okay 10 stretch at the most 12 double attempt murder <clears throat> yeah um <laughs> do you know in our minds in our primitive way of thinking as well i was thinking of okay i know i'm gonna get a sentence but I knew in those times, a gun-related murder was like something like 20 years. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that I've not killed the individuals. Is you know, with my arrogance as well, I'm thinking, who cares? They're criminals as well. They're probably not going to say anything. If anything, I'll probably get a seven or eight and then I'm back. <laughs> then I'm going to do exactly what I was doing from before. With more respect. Yeah, but even then, I felt that I had that respect already. So I weren't really bothered about that. It was just about, at the end of the day, you have to you have to look at your aims and objective. So what is your aims and objective of doing this in the first place? And with a lot of us, we came to the conclusion is to make money. So unfortunately, by any means necessary, but it was actually to make money. So that was always the objective. And we should never try to stray away from that objective. So now that I'm reflecting, I'm looking back and I'm saying that, okay, so what is, okay, so I'm going to spend some time of incarceration. At least I've kept my dignity and integrity. And then I'm going to go back out and I'm going to continue to do what I'm doing. So On the night of that, was it to go out and shoot two people, kill two people, kill one person, shoot one person? What was the... No um basically just to um just to obtain what they what we were told that they had mm -hmm. that's all that's all it was and it got out of hand it's not even that i think they underestimated us because we were young yeah. so if you have like it's like me as well you can't underestimate the young as well sometimes mm -hmm. you're looking at a young man he's there he's telling you i know what you have yeah. And you're looking and thinking 18, 19, like 19, yeah. 20, like for, yeah, yeah do, you, do you know who I am? I think back then that was kind of accepted. Nowadays, <clears throat> I'm more fearful of the young youngs <laughs> because they're fucking ruthless. You're not talking 19, 20, you're talking 14, 15, yeah. 16. Yeah. And that's scary. So, there's no respect, there's no loyalty for the elders, there's nothing. So now it's changed. Now the ones who are, you are most fearful of is the young ones who have got the barley on and just fucking waiting. 15, 16, it's, it's crazy. It's funny that you mentioned that as well, because I know I've said this before as well, but there was an incident. So <clears throat> I was in a, obviously uh, when I was released first, I had to go to AP. So I'm in this particular area, you won't name me. I was in this particular area and I'm walking down the road and there's a group of kids. There's so many of them and they're blocking the road. Now in my times as well, yes, we were moving in different degrees of dysfunctional behavior, but we had respect for our elders not like this, they were blocking the roads and people were just trying to. And so I'm assessing all this situation. I know these kids are not going to move out of the way. So I said, let me give ground. As a grown up, I'm old enough to be their father. So let me try to navigate myself, make myself small. And I'm trying to go, you know, in between trying to make myself small. Now, one of them who I identified, he was the biggest one who I identified as the leader. He came very close to me, almost touching me. Now, I knew then. I can understand that first, they're trying to mark their territory. I understand that. I've lived a particular lifestyle. But what came next as well, this was provocation. 
So what he wanted me to do now was to say something and it all would have set upon me. So I can tell that they were carrying. Obviously we can observe this. They might have had their Rambo knives and so forth. After, I just shook my head. And you know what was so sad to me was kind of heartbreaking as well, that these young people don't even know that they would have thrown away their lives. It's right on the high road and everything. So in case I was foolish enough to say something, of course I would have been a victim. But I'm saying that their lives would have been destroyed and their families' lives would have been destroyed as well because now they're in prison doing, doing a life sentence. For what? Because a man was just trying to mind his own business, go in to see his wife, and he was preventing him from actually doing this. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> the thing was as well, what was so quite funny as well, that sometimes my brothers that are in incarcer incarceration need to understand as well, is that they sometimes live in a time machine. So when I went back to my DCAT and I was actually conversing with them, I told them the story. They said, oh, they didn't know who you was. You would have probably beaten up all of them. I said, I'm not Superman. I said, the, <laughs> I said everything has changed, the whole dynamics. And you lot need to understand this because you'll become a victim very fast outside. <laughs> yeah. So this is, so I totally yeah. understand what you're yeah, saying. You've got to, like I said, like you had said, get, life is a game of chess. Things change all the time, every five years, t 10 years, things do change and you've got to kind of go with the times. If you don't, you're dead. So you've got to kind of be sensible to it. There's not a lot of people do stay open-minded to a change. They're living 40, 50 years ago. Yeah. How long was your court case? Um, I pleaded guilty. And so you still got fucking over 20 straight. What were you getting if you didn't? So I got, no, this is what, this is what actually happened. I got a, this was a new thing. So remember before when they, in America, they had three strikes and you're out. Yeah. Um, England tried to do two strikes and you're out. So before IPP, there was a thing called discretionary life sentence. So due to the severity of your crime, I got a discretionary, which to be fair, shouldn't have happened. And I'll tell you the, the reasons why it shouldn't have happened from what I've got informed about was that it, it's, it came about in, I think it was 97, 97. Now, what they said was that made me applicable for this was because of what I had done when I was a minor. So I was convicted in 95. So they used that conviction of 95 and the crime that I committed that allowed me to get the discretionary life sentence, which was a seven year tariff, <laughs> which I ended up doing three times that amount even though they say that with a discretionary life sentence, it really means on the computer that you're doing 99 years. But at that time, I had no understanding. I was totally oblivious to all what was going on. I was just thinking, yeah, seven, and that was it. I didn't understand. It didn't compute, compute in my mind that I'm actually, I'm actually gonna be in here for a very long time. And some of the, some of the reasoning, sometimes I sit back and I reflect and I realized why I got that because there were people that were shooting off the police and so forth and they didn't even get a discretionary life sentence. And I got a discretionary life sentence. I'm thinking, why is this all happening? And it started to make sense. What I didn't know at the time as well, at that time there was a lot of black on black shootings as well and Trident was getting involved. I know that I was flagged up as an individual as well, that they believed that I've done a string of shootings and got away with it. So there was a lot of other factors that were working behind the scenes against me, which when you're young, again, naive, you're just not seeing it that way when others are observing you. Your name is coming up all the time. So, yeah. Why did you plead to it? <clears throat> again, the young, um, the young lady, there was other factors as well. Obviously, the individual, and I just thought, you know what? Now looking back, I'm thinking, but I felt that she could have get dragged, she could have got dragged into it. I weren't romantically involved with her. She was a lot older than me. It was a friend's sister. And with us as well, we've always had, if you speak to Lou as well, we've always had Patmore is different. We're like a family in Patmore. And we have respect and we accept responsibility. And to be fair, I put my hands up because it weren't supposed to go the way it went as well. You need to also understand that if you make a mistake, you need to deal with that mistake and you need to correct that mistake. And that's how we grew up, especially on Patmore as well. If you make that mistake, you're going to have to deal with that mistake. You're going to have to rectify that mistake. So you took responsibility? Yeah, 100%. So you got, you're thinking you're only going to do a seven? 
Yeah, I thought I was only going to do, yeah, because I found out eventually. I didn't know at the time there was one of the gentlemen was fighting for his life. So it was close. Mm -hmm. They, at one stage, were going to turn off the machine. I didn't know all this, what was going on. But um, he pulled through and I thank God for this as well. What would you have got then if he died? You'd still be in? <sighs> yeah, I know at that time a gun related murder was 20 years. But knowing, I would have probably still be in, yes. Yeah. And how was that? <clears throat> See, at that time though, if they died, would you have cared? Again, we speak the truth, even if it's against ourselves. Not really. I was, I was so, I was in such a bad place. And so this is the reasons why that, um, I'm a person that I usually like to be in the background. Even taking this kind of interviews as well and being conversing with so many people, because I feel that we're at a bad place as a society now. And as what you said, we need sometimes not only real men, but, you know, just real people. We need that community feel again. We need people to stand up and be counted. And I just feel that I also have those tools. And I feel that I could also make a difference and a change. There's many great men that I left when I was in incarceration as well. That could be professors, that could be scientists, but they're just not given a chance in society. They are lepers of society. They're ostracized from society. And I just want to prove to, you know, the general, the general public as well that, look, I've made changes and there's so many other people that have made changes in their lives. Please give us a chance. What prison did you go to? I've been all over. What was the first one? So, uh, when you got oh, your big sentence. Yeah. So initially, <clears throat> so I was on remand. So I was on remand for a year. I started as a young offender. So back in young offenders, but this time it was different because at that time as well, they were, there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of shootings. We're talking about the early 2000s and the late nineties. There was a lot of string of shootings and so forth. So when I was in car when I was incarcerated, then I had nine cousins that was also incarcerated and they had their co-defendants. So again, I still didn't take the magnitude of it. It was all just one big party. So we was just out of control. We weren't listening to nobody. I used to say this to the officers and I'm, I apologize to them as well because I gave them, I gave them murders when I first, when I first came in, I just didn't care. I was, I was thinking that, wait, um, nobody told me anything when I was actually outside you're definitely not going to tell me anything now <laughs> that I'm in prison. And where that I also, prior before that, my first sentence, an officer, because I was always fighting as well, he saw potential. So he said that I should join a boxing club. So when I was out for those two years, I was actually boxing. I was representing my club, Ellsfield. So I traveled up and down the country. I went on the Channel Islands. I beat the number one in the Channel Islands. I boxed everywhere. So I was quite handy with my fist as well. So when I went back in, obviously it was like child's play for me. So um, eventually they had enough. There was a riot. There was a riot on the other side, which one of my cousins was involved. He's got the same, cause I had nine cousins, four of them had the same surname as me. So how they justified moving me as well is because they, they said, the tornado team that they heard, they said, let's get Patterson, but what Patterson? There was lots of us. So what one are you talking, what are referring to? So then they moved me to Chanceford. <clears throat> so they starred me up at 20. I then moved to Chanceford. Whilst I was in Chanceford, they then put me onto the young offender side, but I got like a hero's welcome. So they were thinking this kid's gonna be a problem. So they moved me to the adults. Now you need to understand the whole kind of dynamics of the prison system at that time especially when I first, I saw the dynamics was a bit different. Before, what they used to have, what I saw, they usually have a person controlling the wing. So normally in that, those times, it would probably be a big white guy pushing a lot of weights and he would kind of put people in order and the officers would turn a blind eye to what he was basically doing. But it would keep people in line. So if somebody needed to be just spoken to, so when I went onto the wing, I remember this gentleman, he, he approached me and he's big. 
and he said, um, this is not something like, this is not a young offenders boy. Now I'm not saying he's racist, but to call a black person a boy, and especially there's historical content to this, and he's underestimating me again, just like so many people have, cause I'm young, he thought, and then unfortunate for him, it didn't really work out in the way that he thought it was gonna work out. Remember, I come from a boxing background. <laughs> so then now the whole dynamics have changed. And then I've started to notice that even throughout the prison system, the whole dynamics are changing because my generation's coming in, they're young, they're unruly. Um, we, we don't care whether you call yourself an old villain and so forth. Yeah, okay, you've got guys that can do this. We've got 50 guys outside that will do that as well. So what are you going to do? And so then the whole dynamic shift, now, they, now the prison systems in loggerheads don't know what to do. So what actually happened was, in my Roman time, I was moved so many times. Um, I went to Belmarsh about three times, um, um, Wandsworth about twice, Scrubs about three times, um, all of Penterville about two times. I just, they just kept on moving me, sometimes at courts as well, then the, then the court is saying, I said, how come I'm not going back on the van to go back to that prison? And they're basically saying that that prison doesn't want you. You need to go somewhere else. We don't know where to put you. Everyone's saying no. So I just kept on like moving until I was actually convicted. I kept on moving and that was literally it until, and it was always the same, um, fights, 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 assault on officers, fights, assault on officers, seg, um, had escape attempt, Old Bailey's. What was that escape attempt like? So what actually happened was I had another case so as you know already, I was convicted for the double shooting, but I also had a bank robbery. So I had to go court for that. But this time I realized that there weren't a lot of security and me and my other co-defendant from that, one of my co-defendants have already been convicted for it. So we decided, and I didn't know that my parent, my mother was upstairs and his mother was upstairs. We didn't know, we thought that because it was an awkward day so we thought that this is the best time. So they didn't have, they didn't have like the perspect or nothing. And we just jumped over and then we ran through, but they all seemed to focus on me. And it was like, cause there were so many people that were jumping on top of me and suffocating me and so forth. My friend actually, he could have, <laughs> he could have escaped. It, it, it was a real um, Lauren Hardy moment. <laughs> Why did he not? <laughs> like he turned back and helped me. Yes. And so now I'm angry. I've got all cuts like on my neck. And so I'm just starting to throw punches now. <laughs> like I'm angry. <laughs> like, so then <laughs> now it's dawning to me now, you need to run. So I'm thinking, okay, I remember there was another gentleman that escaped from the old Baileys by jumping out the window. I'm going to do the same thing. So I ran into this room and there was all these police officers drinking their tea and coffee. They just all pounced on me. Even then, like, um, I'm still struggling. <laughs> I'm all like, you know, I'm still trying to fight. I'm, I, I'll never forget my friend as well. It was like, it's over, D. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, it's never over. <laughs> you know, like, I, I, I swear to you, I was like, um, I was like Braveheart. <laughs> it was just like freedom. Yeah. 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 So anyway, they, they kind of hogtied me and just carried me. It was so humiliating. At the time, I thought it was a badge of honor. It was just mm -hmm. embarrassing. So you're all hogtied and they're carrying you like that. And one, I think one jailer, he was so, um, he was just so taken back by the ferocity and everything. He said, I quit. <laughs> <laughs> he just went like, and then, yeah, it was a life of an E-man suit and everything else. And it was just, so yeah, I got, uh, I got another, I got seven years to run concurrent mm -hmm. with my sentence. And yeah. But when you add it all up, the ones you did get away with, the robberies, the shootings, even though in your mind, even though I'm sitting here, I'm thinking that's a bit harsh, but when you add it all up, you're probably lucky as well. 101%. You know what I mean? So you can look at it and that side and go, well, do you know what I fucking did deserve it? I was a mad man. If I wasn't shooting those two people and I didn't got for them, I'm going to kill someone. And then that, there's no going back from that because Poetic. that does something to your psyche.
poetic justice. Yeah. And a lot of people don't understand this. A lot of people glorify it because even before as well, people say, yeah, I like your real stuff. But they don't, they don't know behind the scenes what was actually happening to me. There was, t there was times outside as well that you start not to trust anybody. I started to have extreme paranoia in the sense of, can I really trust this person? Then I would have times where I was so depressed where I'll just walk. And it was crazy for me, like for me to be seen walking outside at any time I could, mm -hmm. like, are you crazy? And the nightmares, it was really bad. I'm talking about like, I would have some severe nightmares where that I'll wake up and I'm crying, I'm crying because I don't want to go back to sleep. I don't know what the next dream is going to be like. And I think a lot of people don't understand this. I was actually being tortured. It was like, it was like torment for me to close my eyes. And the, the way this thing was, I'm going to be honest with you. When I was in the police or, and I knew I weren't going home and you know, that part of my life, that chapter has been closed. I slept like a baby. It was weird. A relief. Were you ever suicidal? No, never. I, I think, I don't know. I have that. God forbid it. Because we never know when the mind can turn. Mm -hmm. So I'm not trying to. I, I just don't know. I have that tenaciousness. I don't know what's the. A lot of pride. Yeah. I think it's from. <sighs> again, yeah. I just. But you never know. So, you know, God, God, for, you know, God forbid it. And I thank God that he's kept me up till now because I know how easy the mind is. And especially when we go further into our conversation and we talk about solitary confinement and so forth. And I spent seven years in solitary. So it does something to the mind. So I understand how easy it is for the mind too. So I never, I will never mock anybody that suffers with mental health issues because I know how easy it is to switch. When did you start kind of questioning the things that you've done because like you say it's to justify everything we've done it's bad mm -hmm. man killing bad man bad man shooting bad man anti-authority fuck the system they abused me and beat me when i was a kid and they made things worse like we can all blame obviously there's a time when you 100%. take responsibility and go wait a minute was there a moment how far into your sentence and solitary confinement that you've done and all the the, the bully are becoming the bully like you were a bullied to then being fucking the bullier basically it shifted like you say everything's a shift but when was there ever a like a little moment when you started going what the fuck am i doing yeah so it comes a bit later so we'll talk further about the solitary confinement side of things yeah how was that how, how seven years in the hole like that's a long time but you must have been a loose cannon no i would have loved to have seen you or I wouldn't have known, but I'd love to have seen your, your mannerisms, the way you speak, the way you talk, <laughs> the way you presented yourself 20 years ago, so I can really judge the the shift of momentum and the shift in life. The transition. Yeah, yeah. do you know what I mean? It's interesting. <laughs> because I know you're sitting there, I can see it. I can see you were a fucking nutcase. I can see that you had that <laughs> madness. And we can, we, we can change our character. And you can change your, to make change, you've got to change your whole personality. So even though you're acting like this and speaking quite articulate and seeing the world differently, the people who you grew up with will think he's lost his fucking mind. Yeah, this yeah, is yeah. an act. They'll think you're fucking joking because they know you're a psycho. This could be another act. Do you know what I mean? You're in the house at night sharpening up your tools, fucking ready to go for round two. <laughs> and people will be saying, I told you so. Because that's what it is. It's psychotic. But men are psychotic. Mm. So no matter you sitting here, and I can understand it. It's an amazing we, thing. And we can be very, um, as, as human beings as well, we can, um, we're scared of change. Yeah. And we can be very pessimistic. So, it's yeah, painful. I've had to explore a lot of painful, you know, painful experiences in my life as well. Mm -hmm. But I think the first, the transition is what you was talking about was before I went into solitary confinement. So when I was in Wilmot Scrubs, um, <clears throat> there was a governor actually, her name was Miss Actor, and she found me amusing. <laughs> because they knew that um i'm always having fights and sometimes but they knew i went a troublesome person i was still polite i said please i said thank you but it's just that if somebody triggers me mm -hmm. it was always that so she found me quite amusing so we would um she would say yeah mr patterson are you going to behave and there was two things so there was a gentleman we would just say saf he was a brother of mine and I used to love his character. It was just the way that he was 
for example, one of the biggest issues in prison is if somebody pushes in in the queue. I was just going to, a gentleman pushed in and I was just going to <clears throat> become very, very aggressive. And he would say things like, brother, just take it easy. Why can't we learn to disagree without being violently disagreeable? And he will say other things such as, all it shows is this man's more hungry than us. Let him eat. We're not going to lose out. And it was such a simplistic way. And it was just like he was liked by everybody. It didn't matter whether you was Muslim, non-Muslim. Everybody had that kind of level of respect for him. And he was just such a nice person to be around. So that was kind of like the trigger. That was like the spark. And I was thinking, you know, there's other ways of communicating with people without going into extreme violence. But also remember this as well, that sometimes uneducated people do uneducated things. So <clears throat> what actually happened is, again, a story of my life. There was this particular gym officer. He took a disliking to me, but I have to be honest, I took a disliking to him. So there came an opportunity. I used to love doing my workouts because um, <clears throat> in those times, they still allowed you to have like boxing um, mitts and gloves and so forth. And there was one particular officer. He was a CM. I liked him, Mr. Jarvis. He was doing a 50-man kumite, so he wanted someone to spar with. And he would call me and we'd say, he, he, he was so funny, he would say, it's the only time you can hit a screw. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you don't know as well as I put in extra power. No. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but he was good. Yeah. He was actually good as well. He can handle himself. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. If I'm not careful, he could knock me out. Yeah, like, some, you know, screws, like, yeah. some screws are tough, man. Men are yeah, men. Yeah, yeah. We have to remember this. Men mm -hmm. are men. No matter what your views are or opinion is, a man is a man. Mm -hmm. So what actually happened was, I know, I'm sorry, lads, but um, this gym officer was, and then unfortunate for him. Then after that, they took the pads and saying that, no, you're training them up too much. Um, <laughs> then after that, I was taken to the SEG, obviously. Conflict of interest and so forth. During that time, Miss Actor, the governor, she fought for me. No, you know, because there was a lot of officers that didn't like that officer. He was considered to be a bully. So they said, okay, he has to stay in the SEG, but he can go education from the SEG. What did you do to him? Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> we can just put it this way. Um, I, I used some of my boxing skills. Yeah, so you punched fuck out him, basically. And yeah, but it was... Severe? Um... I think it could have been, but then I was held back. At the time, I was held back by a family friend and some other residents after. They saw the severity of how it could have went. You could have killed them? Um, I wouldn't pull it. We yeah. don't know. Yeah. It, it, was, it, was, it was getting to a stage where that, because I, I felt that it was just how he was towards me. He underestimated me. I was young at the time. Remember, I used to box um, at light middle, so 69 kilograms. So he's looking at me, he's probably thinking that, yes, I can handle this. And so I was just angry, pent up, anger and aggression. I was taken to the SEG. Um, they agreed that I can go education. And then that's when I met the wonderful Angela. She was the head of the education department. She said, I can see you're highly intelligent but you're talking in all these slangs and so forth. And when you're dealing with professional people, you need to know how to educate yourself in a better light. So what she would actually do as well is go through the dictionary with me. I'd had to learn a word. She would also allow me to conquer my fears by giving presentations on different subject matters. And then from there I became a teacher's assistant and so forth. But at the time there was the gym officers, um, obviously some of his colleagues that were still unhappy. Why is he here? He's just assaulted one of us. Do you know that type of mentality? Yeah. So on a visit, <clears throat> I had a friend come and see me. I had an hour's visit. They're telling me that my visit's been terminated. So unfortunately, I think you know what happens next. I waited. I thought my friend was gone. And then I said to him, what did you say? And because he was so big. And it was like, it's not funny, but it was so comical on what happened. I obviously, I punched him. I turned, I turned around now to face the others because I know they're going to come and steam me now because I've put my hand. I thought he was gone. He was out of the way. But it was the way that 
he kind of like it was momentum like we know as boxers that when you have a good punch and you connect something that you just know the person's out he's not recovering from that and it was he was out but instead of him going back, he went back forward and he dropped on my back whilst I was facing the rest of his colleagues. So I'm trapped underneath. <laughs> and that's where everybody, so when they looked on the camera, they were all laughing. <laughs> like it was a funny moment. He was, start, he was sleeping on me. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but he was on my back. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously they took me from the visits. They dragged me in there. And then obviously, you know, their methods in those times were they give you a spanking. Mm -hmm. So I accepted that. I knew that every time I put my hand on the officer, I expected that there were going to be repercussions as well. So um, <clears throat> after that, I was then moved around and the same, this, you know, this, the same old things going on in all different prisons. I'm being accused of, <clears throat> I'm being accused of all these different, you know, types of activities that are going on. And then I started to become closer to my faith. And then that's when more problems started to increase. As soon as I started to practice more, started to pray, it started to become, I'm a part of the Muslim boy gang. I'm one of the leaders. And then that's when um, it became very difficult for me. How so? <clears throat> difficult, <clears throat> difficult in the sense of that every so often they will just come for me. So I'll be placed in the seg. I'll be moved from prison to prison. And there will be no explanations to me except for SIRs, that's security incident reports, basically saying that we have intel. And that's all it took. Spending um, months in the seg, um, no valid reason, but allegedly, allegedly what? We can't tell you that information. Okay, can I speak to somebody that can? Oh, we'll get back to you. So <clears throat> eventually I... Um, the incident started, so when I was in Dove, the last serious, so one of the last serious incidences were, I was in Dovegate, I've been in Dovegate twice. So the first time I went to Dovegate, there was an, there was an officer, he was an operations manager. He had a problem, obviously with my, we usually use a particular room to pray in for our Juma service, our Friday service. He said that we couldn't use it. So I just asked, like any civilized person that would, you would ask, okay, what are the reasons? Is there different alternatives? He just said, no, I'm telling you. And I don't care that type of attitude. I'm saying, this is faith though. I have an entitlement. At least give us another room or different alternative. And then he said, so what are you going to do about it? And that was my trigger. I know I shouldn't have, but then it's, it's like snakes and ladders. I went back. I just went back to that dark place again. I just, I just had tunnel vision and I just saw him. And so it didn't work out well for him. But I'm so at the time I was angry with um, the brothers at the time that was around me, but I'm thankful to them now because I understood that at the time when um, the incident was happening, Officers weren't aware of what was going on. So there was no bell, there was no nothing. And I was hitting him for a while. And so you can imagine. And so they had to drag me off. And then eventually, and so what happened was, <clears throat> they were so upset because obviously the police are involved now. It's a police matter. It's serious. But how it never manifests itself now, what happened, this, is, this was so strange. I accept full responsibility. But you have to also understand as well, if you say that <clears throat> you work for an organization and you play by those rules, then you're supposed to play by those rules. What actually happened was I was in front of having the adjudication. So they were telling me on regard to the matter of when the police are gonna get involved and so forth. Then IMB, Independent Monitoring Board, so this is a civilian that is there. I'm talking to them like I'm talking to you now. So my back is against the door, I didn't see. The door just flung open. I didn't know, and I just got all punches in my face and everything. They all, all the officers started to lay into me, kicking me on the floor. <laughs> um, <clears throat> had my clothes. Obviously, they used to do a system as well. They cut your clothes, strip cell, cut your clothes. They kind of, you know how they do it when they fold you up, and then one at the end, he kind of sits on you and they wait and they say, "Yeah, go." Go, go, go. And then everyone runs and they slam, they slam the door. 
and I was a mess. So what happened was now, when the police came and they saw the condition of me and so forth, how can they continue with the charges and looking at the state of me? And what's going to happen? Am I going to press charges? Even though we don't do that, but... So they dropped the case, but what they done was they sent me to dispersal. And that was my first time, and that was in 2005. What was dispersal like? <clears throat> oh. <clears throat> I'm surprised they never sent you to Broadmoor. Could that have been a possibility? We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna go into that as well. Mm. Because they did on many occasions. They tried to. They tried to get a lot of um psychiatrists. <clears throat> yeah, because to... beating up one screw it happens. Somebody getting fucking weighed, somebody had enough, had a bad day, found out their message is mm. up to something, they crack up. But it seemed to have been consistent with you. I'm surprised they even let you out without having your fucking shackles on. No, you're gonna see you're gonna the, there's more to come. Believe right. me, James. <laughs> 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 the system weren't finished. That's what they said as well. We're gonna get our pound of flesh over you. Yeah. It's when you least expect it. Which is understandable. Because <laughs> if you're fucking beating them down, it's like a little firm, it's like the coppers. They stand together. No mm. matter how what they are trying to do good or wrong, they they'll all stand together yeah and um i learned a very very hard lesson mm -hmm. and you're gonna find out soon so yeah <clears throat> so i went to disperse I, I went to disperse and i saw that the whole dynamics was different now this was a whole different caliber of individuals i i saw it like these were these were gentlemen these were men that were so disconnected from society now that it it seemed like kind of mad max it was like a dystopia. It was like a gladiatorial contest, survival of the fittest. It was crazy. Like one of the first things that I identified when I went onto the wing in high security as well, when somebody will come out the kitchen with a pot in their hands, everybody will be moving sideways, all be observing. And I'll be just standing there and a person will tap me and say like, we've had the way you don't know where that's going. And, and, Sometimes, nine times out of 10, it's just somebody just cooking their food and just yeah. going. But sometimes it could be used as ghee, where you that's, go. I think that's one of the most, no, it was oil. Because yeah. remember this, in dispersals where you can cook food. Mm -hmm. So you had oil or ghee, butter, ghee. So it's tremendous. The I think that's probably some of the worst instances that I've ever seen when somebody pours when you leave it to bubble up for such a long period of time and it goes actually black and then somebody pours it over a person, it's horrific when you hear them scream and so forth. The smell. So, <clears throat> but what was actually happening is I had a good solicitor. Her name was um, Tracy, Tracy Greaves. So I thank her as well. And then eventually I had another solicitor. Her name's Melton, thank you. But <clears throat> at the time, they contested it. So what they said is that if this man now has found not guilty for this assault on this officer, it's being thrown out, what is he basically doing in high security? Which made sense because the whole reason why I was there, because I'm not a cat yet. Yes, there was when I was in Belmarsh, I was put as a potential cat A, but then they removed me from that. So I was a B cat technically. So why can't I go to a B establishment? So what they done was, which was a luck, but it didn't really work out well for me because I'm going to tell you in a second, is that um, I said, okay, then. They sent me to, if my memory serves me correctly, I went to Gartry. So when I was in, when I was in Gartry, it was, <clears throat> there was a lot of tension. At that time as well, as we know already that there was a lot of things that was actually happening outside with, you know, people saying that with Islam and there was a lot of Islamophobic, I will say rhetoric in prison as well. A lot of these guys felt that, well, we're going to tarnish you all with the same brush. So when I went to, when I went to Gartry as well, I was hearing things like, and remember my sense of social injustices, like three Muslims in a, in a cell and a guy comes in, he slaps all of them in their faces and says, go back to where you come from. They're born over here. So I'm thinking, really? <laughs> so when I've arrived, I said, who? Tell me who it is. So then they pointed me out to this particular individual. I went up there, just man to man. I said, okay, gladiatorial contest. 
you don't like my faith and so forth. You want to do some type of crusade. I don't know what you're thinking. I don't know who you are. I don't really care about this. I'm just looking at, I'm just looking at you as a shallow man. So we're going to resolve it like men. So when I enter this gentleman's arm, um, I was expecting, I was expecting us to go, obviously, to engage, but he didn't. And I actually saw, I looked in his eyes and I saw that he was scared. And then he tried to make excuses, but now I felt a way. I felt that I'm not really a bully. One thing that I was taught, and even my faith teaches me as well, that if somebody, always give a man a doorway to save face. Don't pursue it. Don't press it. So he said he didn't want nothing to, so we kind of shook hands like a, a gentleman's agreement. I left. Now the most embarrassing moment was for me now. I'm on the toilet, I'm in my cell. The door, f the door flies open. Um, It's the Muftis. So what we say Muftis is officers that are wearing PPE kits. So they have the shields, the helmets. <laughs> they basically came in on me. I'm there on the toilet. I'm saying, I'm on the toilet. They said, boy, you can finish off when you go down the seg. That's what they said to me. So I'm taken to the, I'm, I'm taken to the seg. And then they basically, they're basically saying that um, I've been bullying. I've been forcing people to pray. They were saying all this kind of rhetoric, which weren't true. And then that's it. I'm back at Whitemore. What a short trip. I think I spent under, less than six months I was there. A lot of the people, a lot of people don't know, but <coughs> it is the Muslim boys who run the prisons now. It is the Muslims who've got a strong brotherhood where they, a lot of them are calling the shots from the way it used to be. Everything's kind of changed. Why did you choose Islam? I, I embraced Islam when I was 16. So I was early. always, yeah. I was always an inquisitive person, see, because I come from a very, um, you could say a very religious family. For example, my grandmother from my, fa my fa um, father's side, she was a Catholic. My grandfather used to be a Catholic, then he became a Jehovah. My grandparents from my mother's side were Church of England. I used to be an altar boy. I read passages in the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So <laughs> I was always inquisitive, but there was questions that I used to pose as well. And do you know, especially in my times, I think I might be slightly older than you, where that they used to say that um, children are supposed to be seen, but not heard. So it was never convincing. Cause I was always a kid that asked many questions. Even when I used to travel with any of my relations, I would, just const I would just constantly ask them, oh, so what about this? Why is this? And it was funny. My friend who introduced me to it at the time, they called him Jam Man. We was like two of the smallest guys. And he would mention Islam, but in his version, it didn't like, <laughs> if he didn't really look deeply into it, no disrespect to him, he didn't really know too much about his faith. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it made the, the little bits that he did say made sense to me, if that makes yeah. sense. And I said, let's give me something to read. <laughs> so <laughs> he was just like, because I think for him, it was a different experience, you know, like growing up. He's like, like with us, like we would have to go like, you know, I have a Sunday school. My father was a 12th tribe, Rastafarian and so forth. So, you know, it's different, but my father never imposed this belief system on us. Mm -hmm. So um, then I embraced. And that's what I said to a lot of people. Like, I didn't do this because I was trying to be accepted or jump in a lot of people. But then they said that, so what happened then? If you found that utopia, then why did you cause a dystopia? We don't understand it. Like, what's going, what's, what's going on? And I said that, but it was different. There was a different dynamics there. Because I felt that, especially as a Caribbean as well, that we were socially excluded. So a lot of, <clears throat> in those times as well, a lot of it was based on culture rather than the teachings, Islamic teachings itself. So you would have like, you know, Asians stuck with Asians, Africans stuck with Africans. And it was just like the Caribbeans were at the bottom. 
That's how it felt. Even if a white person embraced Islam, they would be in front of us. It was just like this kind of caste system. Mm -hmm. And it was very weird. And I said that that's not the teachings that I read about. This is not what my understanding is. Going into a mosque and people don't want to pray shoulder to shoulder to you. It's like you're a leper or something, like I've got a disease or something. So I was very disheartened, especially being the age that I am as well at that time. I'm just thinking, being 18, coming out, thinking the world. And then I just thought, you know what? Forget them. I still believe in my belief system, but I'm just going to do what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> taking it back. So people say that it weren't that. I can, I can tell you this personally because I've, ex I've experienced the whole change within the high security estate. At first, as what I said, it was like a Mad Max. There was a lot of bullying. We need to be honest here. Let's speak the truth. It was such, there was so severe bullying that we're talking about, there was guys that had to tell their mothers to bring in drugs for them. We as Muslims as well, as those that were practicing saying that, you can't do this. It doesn't care what color or nationality or where he's from because this little white kid's from the country and he hasn't got nobody to defend him. So people think that it's easy for, for them to walk over him. It's not going to happen. So we didn't even, you can't compel somebody to the faith. So what some brothers started to do as well is saying that, yeah, well, this person's under my protection. What are you going to do now? And then that's how it started. But the funny thing, what a lot of people don't understand about this conflict as well, there was always skirmishes. But the thing that actually triggered all this escalation of violence between what I would call those that had kind of EDL sent sentiments compared to Islam, it started with two non-Muslims. It's what people don't understand. That's why that sometimes um, I laugh to myself as well. It started with two non-Muslims. That's how it started. It started with two non-Muslims having a fight and one group of individuals decided that, wait there, their friend is not getting the better of this other person, even though he was much bigger and stronger and he was trained in boxing. So we're going to rush him. And a Muslim saying, you're not going to do that. And he defended that person. By then, they sent letters to each other. They call it kites. Sorry. They, said, they um, called it kites sending it to different wings saying that go to the gym at this particular day and then to attack that Muslim and then not knowing that that day there, there was a lot of Muslims in the gym. Then it, obviously they came unstuck. The, the 10 or nine of them that went in there looking to hurt that Muslim. Then by them being taken to the seg and the officer sending them to Franklin, now, I'm not going to blame a lot of these, um, the guys that were in Franklin, because they, they only went by what they got told. So as soon as they went to Franklin and said that, yeah, you know, the Muslims are attacking the, um, the white guys up there and beating up white guys, then obviously anyone's going to, it's close to hearts. They say, oh, so that's what they're doing. So what did they do in Franklin? Let's speak the truth. I'll speak the truth. Then they hurt the Muslims that was in there. They beat them up. The Muslims that was in Franklin. So what happened was after that, it spread it across the whole high security estate that, okay, Franklin has just beaten up all the brothers. So what the brothers done from all different dispersals, putting applications to go to Franklin. So now some brothers are getting shipped out there. Then there was a situation where that we knew that because people are saying that the Muslims are running the prison system, but we have so many elements against us. For example, as well, let's be honest, people tend to gravitate to their own. So the officers more can identify with those gentlemen than they can with us. So sometimes you would see there's metal detectors and things such as this, and you're seeing guys that are coming off the landing with blades like this, and you know that an officer felt that. So he allowed that to happen. Then this person gets disarmed and gets stabbed, and then that person. I'm not saying that every single Muslim was a victim or he was innocent. Of course, there's people that, look, I've, I've watched podcasts where that individuals have, have owned up to it, that I was only pretending to be a Muslim for the until I was outside mm -hmm. and then I came out and it was all. So we know there's pretenders, there's masquerades, but, but that's, in life though. Hmm, that's human beings. Yeah. Me. But sometimes when people have to also understand it done a lot as well, like people are talking about, okay, I'll give you an example. They said to me that you're preventing people from 
listening to music, that's incorrect. Because my family was in a famous group, my uncles, there was eruptions. If you can remember that soon, I can stand the rain. Mm -hmm. That's my family. My father was in a my father was in a sound clash called Young Lions. So music's always been a part of my life. It's not that. But one thing that I was taught by old school guys, it didn't matter what color you was. When I went into the dispersal system, this is what they said to me. It don't care how tough you are, they'll put you under manners. They said this, after 10 o'clock, the sound volume goes low. <laughs> so everybody, it's a culture. It weren't that we just came and we tried to implement something. Everybody knew. So if you're going to put your headphones in, listen to your music. But after 10 o'clock, this, this was the ruling. In any dispersal, you can talk to anyone. After about 10 o'clock or so forth, the sound goes down. Or somebody will come up and, and have a word with you. It don't matter who you are. I've seen the rise and fall of so many people. Not one man is tough enough to say that, well, he stands alone and he can tell anybody. People like to lie as well in the sense of they'll make it out like, yeah, nobody told me anything. Anyone can get disciplined in, in dispersal. Hmm. It doesn't matter who you are. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, so these were, the, um, these were the things that were happening. And obviously it escalated to such a degree where that, let's fast forward it. After Juma service, a gentleman got his throat cut. They said it was me, but we need to take it back a bit. So two weeks prior, before this, a few officers got injured. They said, um, I was a part of it. Yes, I will admit that I protested because what they were doing is they were re restraining another resident. I didn't like the method of what they were doing. It seemed like it was going to be a, a George Floyd moment where that they had he um, their knees to his back, they were pulling, like he was choking. In court, the officer said, I must admit, this is what the officer said, he was choking. So they asked him, why didn't you release his neck? Oh, but I went holding his neck. So you agree with Mr. Patterson, he was. And he said, yes, actually, I was actually exonerated from that case. So they said I came along and injured. This particular officer that got injured as well, he was actually fired from the prison service. This is what a lot of people don't understand. He was fired and some of his cronies were fired as well. They were fired. He's suing the prison service. I know we can't mention names for legal reasons and so forth, but you can do your research. He was fired. So you can imagine for another, you know, for somebody who represents the prison system to be fired, you know that he had to be doing some dark deeds. He had to be doing some seriously dark deeds because they don't normally do that. They cover up everything. So um, <clears throat> I went down to the SEG. Now, you know, especially in high security, it's conflict of interest, especially when police are involved, you get shipped out straight away. You stay in the SEG for many months and they'll move you to another SEG, to another dispersal. It was very strange. After about two weeks, I was back on the wing. Do you know what everybody said to me? They're coming for you. And I'm like, no, no, they probably know like he's a liar and so forth because everybody knew he was corrupted. They had a whistleblower. Officers actually threw him under the butt. Like they said, he's a horrible person. Women said we didn't feel safe around him <laughs> from their own colleagues. They were like, um, something's going to happen. And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm like even doubting it as well. I'm thinking, stay positive. Why is everyone so pessimistic? Now it made sense. This person's throat, throat gets cut. I'm next to the imam. They've come for me. But now it looks bad because when they came for me, I'm thankful to the brothers. They, they stood as like a protection in front of me and saying, why are you grabbing him for? What has he done? I didn't want to get nobody in trouble. So I just said that, you know what? Just let them take me. So <clears throat> I thought, okay, that's okay. I'm in the seg. I can easily exonerate myself. I've got witnesses. That's it. I'm hearing so many doors being opened and closed. I'm thinking, what's going on? They filled the whole seg up with, with the Muslims. The whole seg was filled. And then the whole um, the hospital side was filled. And then all the buses came and they started to move people. Now the bus is not coming for me. And I'm thinking, why? They said, yeah, you've been promoted. 
I looked and I said, why? First and foremost is you're an ACAT. Just, we just got approved by the home office. I thought already, you know how long that takes? Remember I was potential cat A before, so I know how long it takes. They said, you should have never been a B cat. <laughs> then they said, oh, you've been promoted. I said, okay, what? Yeah, CSC. I'm thinking, what is that? CSC, I've never heard of that. What are you talking about? Close supervision center. So they're saying that to somebody, the only way that was described to me, you know, you know that, you know that guy, Charles Bronson, what them man is on, that's crazy. Only like, only like less than 1% of the prison population would ever face that. That's like extreme isolation. And I'm thinking, nah, it can't be, I have to be assessed. So obviously they assessed me there. I was in the seg. Um, for about seven and a half months. And then they said that, yes, it's been approved that you're going to go to Woodhill for further assessment. So I was on full PPE. That's again, protective. I was on a seven man unlock and I was double ratchet. I then, it was crazy. When I went, when I stepped onto the unit on the CSC, it was so demoralizing. It feels like, you can even ask Lou when he came to see me, like him and his father came to see me in Belmarsh and how I was caged up. It was so demoralizing for the spirit. It just felt, I felt so much weight on my shoulder. It was just, and they put me on an extreme regime. They said that I was manipulative. They said I suffer with glib. That means um, words come easily, but you're insincere. They said I had psychopathic tendencies. And they said that I was one of the um, leading, leading figures of the Muslim boy gang. And what they wanted to start doing now is removing the leaders and putting them into solitary confinement. So I was one of them that they classified as influential within the system, the dispersal system. So my earliest memory I went there, the officers are harsh when I was there. They were very skilled and drilled. You can see their movements were very calculated in the sense of they knew exactly. And let's not beat around the bush. They've always dealt with many, many dangerous people. So now these are the officers. I call them like the SAS of officers. These are the ones that will take you down. And no one's going to complain because you, you are now considered out of the, there's about 50 of us as the most dangerous prisoners in the whole entire country. <laughs> so it's not something light and they're not taking it light. So one of the rulings that they had, I couldn't have, um, I couldn't have my trainers. I couldn't have my toothbrush. I didn't have a pen, no television. You had to earn all those things slowly, but gradually. And I remember being placed in my cell, looking around, and I was thinking, <clears throat> how am I gonna deal with this? And then I remembered that when I was younger, I was always socially excluded, like in primary school, in the headmaster's office, had to do my work there. Then in secondary school, in the headmaster's office, always, so I'm thinking, I can actually do this. But then there was moments, people asked me, so what was the hardest time? It weren't so much the solitary confinement. It was the attitude and behavior that came with being in solitary confinement. It was so cold. And they said, so the way that I looked at, what kept me going was four things. Obviously, my faith, my belief in God, my family and friends, patience and discipline. Why I say belief in God? Because in my faith and even in Christian belief as well, it says that God never gives, gives you a burden greater than what you can bear. Family and friends, <clears throat> I would put um, united we stand, divided we fall. So they gave you that kind of spark. 
I would say, when I said patience, the peace of mind is obtained by being patient. And I will say discipline, the world's a teacher to a wise man and the enemy to the fool. So these are the kind of principles that I kind of held on to. But it was something that I was reading and it allowed me to, it allowed me to laugh at myself. It was two books actually, Conversation with Myself, with um, Nelson Mandela, when uh, all the trials and tribulations that he went through and the times when he was in solitary confinement. And there was another lady as well. She was accused of being a part of the Muslim Brotherhood, which was a banned organization in Egypt. And she was tortured. They done many horrific things to her. And especially her being a woman, we probably know what they also done to her as well, which was described. I won't um, horrify the listeners. And it was something that she said though. She said that the final insult they done was they chopped off one of her hands and then they paraded her to the people like, look what we've done to this woman. And she started to laugh. So they thought that she lost her mind. And she said this, and it always stuck with me. And I'm always going to repeat this to the day I die. She said, the sweetness of faith has allowed me to forget the bitterness of pain. And then I said, that's what my... What my friend John Boy used to say, he, was, he used to be a traveler that was in isolation as well. He said, give your head a wobble. <laughs> so I gave my head a wobble and I just said, you know what? I can do this. But it was horrible though, because at times as well, and especially when you're moved, there was one particular officer and he took a great disliking to me. I understand that he lost his comrades in the war, but first and foremost is we're not in the war. Secondly as well, I'm in for terrorists, terror related incidences. Everybody knows this. I'm from Patmore and I will say this Ox Lou. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I don't know what you're talking about, but he was things like, you want to take our jobs, you want to take our women and everything. And he kept on like, so I've put in complaints saying that, look, a situation is going to happen. I feel in fear of my, I feel in, in fear of my personal safety. Um, and then one day a situation happened. And I lashed out. Also taking into consideration that I'm still now going to court for the, the throat being, uh, you know, the gentleman whose throat was cut, plus the other officers that were injured. Now this is a third case. They've all combined it. So what they done was I was fighting with them. I didn't know the extent of my injuries until then. I was taken to one of the cells within two days. I was then moved to full Sutton Seg. There, they were very serious down that Seg. Um, they were waiting for me. I knew I was looking to get a paste in. But then they saw the extent, like for some reason, I was kind of struggling to take my top off. When they saw my ribs, they said, we're not taking responsibility for this. Get him x-rayed. Then they said something like fractured ribs and, and so forth. But there was a lot of, there was a lot of ill treatment, like especially even in the seg, in the segs, and I was being moved around. So remember, my court case is going, but there was some advice as well. I remember his name was Big Rubble. People talk about Charles Bronson all the time, and no disrespect, I'm not taking anything away from him. But there's other guys that are down there, like you've never even heard of. Like this guy has spent. 25 years in solitary confinement as well. This guy is extremely intelligent, but he's actually given up in the sense of, given up in the sense of that he just doesn't like anyone in uniform. And I can understand because of his treatment all these years and so forth. And he said something to me. He said, kid, he told me because he's a lot older than me. He says, kid, I liked him. We used to always debate. He's highly intelligent. He says, kid, you may um, you may listen to me, you may not, but you know you've entered a new world. I said, okay. He says, this is what I tend to do. I can give you some advice. I tend to pace up and down, make sure that you have a routine. And he said one thing to me. He said that when eventually you get your television, he says, watch a cartoon. Okay. He says, it softens the heart. And these are the kind of things that I hang on to. And there was a stage where that 
I was in some sectors when I'd be extremely cold, especially if you're up in the north of the country. You know, especially. And they give you one blanket. <laughs> and I would have like, and I'd be wrapped up like near the pipes. And I always envisioned myself like just talking to an audience or just making changes. And I thought, one day I thought, you know what? I'm going to die here. You know that thought? And I remember talking to my mum and my mum cried. And I said to my mum that, look, mum, I don't think I'm going to survive. And, you know, because of my belief system as well, can you do something for me? She said, what's that? I said that, look, if I'm died, please make sure that I'm buried in a Muslim cemetery. Please, and I'm sorry for all the pain and misery that I've actually caused you in my life. And I really mean that. Because by then, for the first two years, I didn't get a visit. Because they were saying there were a problem with my visitation. So it was very hard. So some of the conversations, and when my, eventually when I did have a visit, and my uncle came and saw me, one of my uncles, he burst out crying. I've never seen my uncle cry. I looked to state. I didn't know. I thought I was okay. He knew that. And the whole, they said it can be alarming. And you have to remember that when I had the visit and you, I was like on a seven man unlock, you have them, you have the table like this and you have them all around the table. So it's very intrusive. And <clears throat> I remember my mum crying and, and I had a lot of time to reflect on my life. So now I'm fighting the case. So <clears throat> going to court, what they said was that um they had intel that I was looking to um people were looking to break me out. So I had to go to Belmarsh, back to the second Belmarsh, and use the underground passage to go to Woolwich. So I, w I went there. When I went there, I, heard, I saw a lot of officers all lined up. I'll never forget this. This was the first time that I started to observe that there is some people trying to make changes as well, but sometimes it's very difficult when they're fighting against a lot of resistance. For the first time, when I really felt human contact, a governor, it's good that he's retired. Um, I don't know whether I can mention him or not, but anyway, a governor, he, he sat next to me and even me, I kind of seized up like thinking, what's he doing? Like, I'm so conditioned now of having all these kind of protocols that when he sat next to me, I was like, and he said that, look, I believe in giving people chances. You came with a massive, massive reputation. Um, so I said, look, I said, excuse me, sir. I'm not here to cause any problems within your establishment. I just want to be left alone. He said, I can do that. There were still some officers a bit upset because they heard about, you know, all the officers that got hurt. And there was one officer that was a female that got hurt. But when they looked at the footage and they saw that she crashed into the table. So after the first court appearance, I came back to my cell. I had everything. Television. They gave me everything. But I didn't want too much because I knew that eventually after court case is over and so forth, that's all going to disappear again. That's all going to evaporate. And they said to me, you've been set up. That's what they said their own words um it got thrown out the judge the judge was saying what is this this is silly but then the imagine this the crown prosecution service and the prison service they appealed it and got me to go to central london the appeal courts they got it overturned and i had to go back to court and fight it again what they basically said was that i was connected with the taliban this was a hit the guy that got his throat cut was supposed to be northern alliance I'm supposed to be working for the Taliban, Afro-Caribbean. My parents are from, my grandparents are from St. Vincent <laughs> and St. Lucia. How is this kind of connection working? I had these interna international links. Then what they basically, so what they basically done was that got thrown out. Another judge also said, what is this? The jury couldn't make a decision. And in my third trial, I was basically found um, not guilty for the throat, I'm um, not guilty for the assaults on all the officers and what helped me because I had a whistleblower. So from them, whistleblower. And um, the last one I was found guilty. So the one with the officer, the army, the army guy that believed that we was there and there were, I was found guilty for both of them. But I could have won that case as well. But I'll be honest with you, 
you know how we've grown up? We never burnt the bridge that brought us over, death before dishonor, never bite the hand that feeds you. I could have won the case and my barrister wanted to use something, but I knew that it would have uh, implicated an officer that was very kind to me when I was at my lowest. I couldn't do that. So I said, I'd rather lose this case than indicate this officer. And the barrister was saying, no, but I said, no, nah, I'm not doing it. I said, you're going to have to listen to my directions. So that's how I lost the case, that particular case. But I knew I could have won it if I... It all sounds tiring. It's yeah. a tiresome life, brother, isn't it? Like all the pain and fighting. When you break it all down, who the fuck are you fighting for? You know what I mean? Isn't it crazy? It is psychotic behaviour. So when you actually break it all down, all the fighting, all the pain, all the destruction, <clears throat> nobody wins. Hmm. And that's the mad thing. And you're right, because it was something that an officer said to me as well. He said, Patterson, remember this as well. You're getting older, we're getting younger. And it was so true. It is, irrespectively. But they knew by then I've actually made the changes and adjustments in my life. But obviously that the system was very, you know, the system was still mm -hmm. upset. So then eventually I spent seven years in solitary confinement. Um, they had, at the ending, they had like a pathway through where, uh, what a pathway is, it's like the final part where that you get more flexibility, you're mixing more with the guys that are in solitary confinement and you can cook some food and they're preparing you to go back onto the wings. When I went back onto the wing, I had such a warm re reception. It was so beautiful, the whole wing. I'm talking about people from like, one of the first people was like Colin Gunn. He gave me like little munchies and everything. It was all different nationalities, you know, Dean and, Dean and Colin, um, the outlaws, they're the outlaws, they're from Manchester. Then I had my brothers, Abdul Rahim Chaos and so many people. And it's just kind of wrong because what a lot of people don't understand that 95% they I know that they've done this this was an old statistic I don't know about now but in my time 95% of the people became mentally unwell once they went onto the CSC and was admitted into Broadmoor and it's a bit unfair like what they're also doing on some of the other residents that are still there Kevin Fakra has been there for nearly 14 years this is not right um you have Abdul Rahim he hasn't had a disciplinary hearing so he's not being found guilty. So when you don't have a disciplinary, you're you're considered as an exemplary prisoner since 2006. But why is he always being moved from segregations and units? And we're in 2024. Something does need investigating. I'm not saying that the whole system is is bad. But what I'm actually saying is that <clears throat> there needs to be a system in place where there can be accountability because it's unfair. It's destroying people's lives as well. We're still human. It's like what one, one brother said as well. He said, sometimes people think we're robots. We still have feelings. See the people who was in that prison, the, the, the Charlie Bronsons and stuff, did you feel you deserve to be there as well because of the shit you done or were you still sane in a way where you thought, nah, this ain't right? Or did it feel more comfortable? Because that is for the mentally insane, that is for the ones who are, mm. you can't trust them. Like, That's you know yourself, listen, there yeah. is innocent people in prison, but the majority of people in deserve to be there as well. The system is there for a reason. Listen, yeah. I've had people on who's been fucking done 20 stretches and they've been innocent and it's sad, but yeah. that's only a very small percentage. 100%. So when you're in with the madmen and the mentally insane, did you feel out of place or did you feel it was normal? No, I felt out of place. But then the system thought that I was just a master manipulator. But how long can you keep on playing a role for? Mm -hmm. I done it consistently and I kept on telling them. And then they started to put things like psychopathic tendencies. We believe that you're just playing a game, you're a master manipulator and so forth. But who have I, who have I manipulated? Then they started to write things. I'll tell you how severe it got as well. That they basically said that I radicalised my mum. My mother... It's crazy. I'm radicalizing my family. I'm radicalizing my friend. My friends. Well, do you see Lou radicalized? <laughs> I say this because you know him. 
Mm-hmm. Like, you know, it's crazy. It's like we're all human beings. So it got so, and this wasn't the end of it. It was only the beginning. So eventually, anyway, I'm progressing through the system nicely until I got to a seek at Brixton. This is where the problems blew up even more. Who so? So I'm on the LPU. This is a pathway out. So LPU unit now is, I'm already on general population, but LPU is for long-termers. They help you. And you so from there, you would either be released back out into society or you go to a DCAT. Now what they're basically saying is that within the short space of time, I've had 50 SIRs written against me. I'm thinking, who? But by how? Even the officers were arguing as well, saying that Mr. Patterson doesn't do anything. He stays in his cell. He knows that he's not allowed in anybody's cell. Nobody's allowed in his cell. Maybe I was happy with that. Then they can't say that I'm whispering anything. It's like a small space. So you can hear all the conversations and everything. The psychologists, the officers on the wing and the psychologists were defending me. I have to give it to the Brixton staff. So thank you for being brave. Do you know what they got told? To shut their mouths and to continue their work. Maybe you lot need to look and Mr. Patterson's manipulated you lot as well. Well, I can manipulate so many people. Who am I? Who, who do they think I am? So um, <clears throat> they would search. I would have regularly, um, regular cell searches because they said that they believed that I was in communication with outside cells to commit um, some atrocities in the streets of Britain that I was leading, training underground cells. It was crazy. So eventually I had a parole hearing. It was absolutely crazy. I've never seen nothing like it. Halfway through my parole hearing, they've informed me that I need to leave because there's information that I can't be privy to. Then my barrister had to sign something that she's liable for imprisonment as well if it gets leaked out. I'm thinking, what's going on? So she looked at me, she said, do you trust me? I said, of course. She said, leave it with me. So what the viewers have to also understand is what this, the parole board, that's another difficult, it's another, it's not, it's another difficult process because they do a system which they call probability. So remember when I was found not guilty for those offenses, what the parole board were basically saying is that, well, the courts may have found you not guilty, but we still believe that you're guilty of those offenses. And that can, can de- that can determine whether you progress or you don't. How is that fair? So how do you have, so they're saying that, okay, we didn't get you in the courts of law, but we can still get you in the parole board because we can still find you guilty. And it was absolutely crazy. And so this is what I was battling. So eventually anyway, yes, I got my open conditions. I thought, yes, that's it now. After how many years? So by then it was, I think it was what? 20 years. How did you go from an ACAT to a CCAT? How long did that take you? And what was the process mm. to then make those changes to get to a CCAT, mm. especially being so violent outside a prison and inside, especially being mm. that Charlie Bronson character where you could have been doing a 50 stretch, you could have died in there. Yeah, yeah. How did you make those changes? What, what was the turning point? Yeah, so um, the turning point was a lot of things as well. I must admit, when I went onto the mains in Full Sutton, the, um, there was a CM. She actually called me into the office. What I'm hearing for your story, it's always women <laughs> who change your life. And it's always women who you sacrifice your life for court cases. You put your hands up. I don't want mm. us women. 20 stretch. The women, Angela, you kind of listened. Mm. The other governor, like, it's always women who you seem to listen to more. Why? Mm. I, s- I don't know. I just, I just feel that, um, I think it's their approach. I just felt that they understood. Does that make sense? So. Is that because of the respect you have for women as well with your mother and all your sisters? Mm-hmm. Where you understand maybe that feminine energy and you know you're not being tested? Yeah, because I've got, you know what? Yeah, you're right, maybe, because I've got nine sisters. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've no other option but to fucking listen, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Feisty. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's actually thought provoking. I've never really looked too deeply into it like that. I just saw it as like it makes sense. I don't do you know with me, I tend not to gender stereotype. I tend to just take a person how they are. And especially in, we need to be honest here as well. A lot of guys don't want to talk this, but in the line of, let's be honest, it, the times when I used to practice the demonic arts, that's why I call it demonic arts, because it is. If you can look at somebody and have no feelings when you're shooting them, it's demonic. Um, If you're involved, it didn't matter whether you're a woman or a man, if you're involved in that la type of lifestyle, you also suffer the consequences. That's how it worked. People don't want to talk about that because it's kind of taboo. Like, oh, what, what? No, it, it doesn't matter if you're involved in that type of lifestyle. So for me, it was that if you, if you, if it makes sense and you're saying the right thing. So how she came across, she, she said that, look, you're old school. We're old school, but you need to understand that times have changed and it has. When I came out, it's like, in gray hairs like I've lost my hair um some of the guys that you know I was now is the younger guys and they're like they're calling me it started with big bro I got you then it started with uncle I got you, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, I think you what's going on I'm still for young they're calling me uncle I'm not uncle <laughs> like, so I'm just like no like they're saying and not only that I've started to see changes like there was this there was this young um, guy named Connor. Um, we were running. So everybody's open conditions. Everybody's watching and we're jogging. You know, I still think I've got it. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you, but these are young. These are, these are young bucks. You know, they're running. I started to feel like, you know, I'm breathing heavy. Nah. <laughs> I'm struggling. I'm thinking, there's only, there's only about 600 meters to go. I can still do it. You know, like yeah. that. And he's just looking and he's like, you know, he just looks at me, gives me that look like, unks, I'm going now, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and then he's calling me, saying, come on, come on. And I'm like, I'm going to pull a hamstring here now. <laughs> so it was just, yeah, it was, um, yeah, the whole dynamics changed. So she said there's a lot of like, she says on both sides, a lot of young officers, there's a lot of, there's a lot of old, um, there's a lot of um, young officers, there's a lot of young inmates as well. So she says, if any of the officers you feel that's before, come to us first. And I respected that. And I said, that, look, I'm not here to cause a disruption. So what happened was eventually they observed me. I was there for in the dispersal for about a year before they moved me on. They said that, listen, we need to get you out. You need to go home. That's what the officers actually said. I became in that time I became a wing representative. They liked the way that I resolved situations and the rest of my peers did as well. So they nominated me for being a prison count council member. That means that I had access to the governors. I would actually sit on the table with governors. There's no officers around. So they trusted me. Mm -hmm. And then we will have discussions on regards to what the demands of the other residents are and how they're feeling and so forth. Then when I moved on from there, I then went to um, Dovegate. Again, the roles followed me. I became a violence reduction rep. I became a um, wing representative. I had so many jobs that was so too much. I had to relinquish quite a few. And then the trust started to build. They started to say that, look, this guy is really for change. Um, a lot of things that I've had to deal with internally as well. Like now and again, you get challenges. Cool. So there was there was one case, and this is when I knew that I I have changed. <clears throat> so there was a young man. Now I understood, but at the time it was quite emotional. There was this young man and this other man. He's quite very wealthy. He's a millionaire. He's flashy with it, but it's up to him. He's he's earned his money. You know, he's legitimate. He's earned his money, so he can be flashy. But they were like the best of friends. So one day I'm just, I like to read. So one day I'm sitting down reading. My, my door's like being knocked erratically. I'm saying, come in. This gentleman, older gentleman, slightly like, I would say that he's probably seven years older than me. His face is a mess. 
He says, they've robbed me. Like his watch. He had a very, very expensive watch. He said, they've robbed me. They've beaten me up. And I just felt protective over him. You know, like I'm thinking like, what's happened? I said, who? He says, the kid. I'm saying, what kid? I'm saying, what? I called him like your son. I said, what, your son? He said, well, yeah, him. I said, no. I said, you know, like me, I'm, I'm so silly as well. But I said, like, I said are you sure? <laughs> you, know, you know, like, so I don't mean to laugh. I'm not laughing over this matter. Uh, yeah, of course. So, he, so he's like, yeah. So I said, you know, one thing that I've learned in life as well, there's always two sides to every story. Don't jump to conclusions. Let me just ask. So I called a, another individual that said that he was aware of this situation. So we're talking. This young kid now, very strong, very big. You can see he's a total gladiator. You can see all the scars and marks and this is a tough kid. He's not an idiot. He's, he's, he's got gladiatorial skills. We know this. He's just come out of all of a sudden, he says, what are you, he uses the P word. What are you P words talking about? If you've got to say anything, we can do it now. Like, you know, whether that was kind of attitude. So I looked at my friend and I said, did I just hear that correctly? Now, you know, like, now I'm thinking, I'm talking to myself and I'm saying, calm down. But I said, he started to bounce around now because he's really big. He's starting to bounce around like, so I'm thinking, okay. Remember, I done boxing. You see, come to close proximity. I said, you know what, let me put my trainers on because I had my sliders on. I said, I don't even want to get caught off guard there because they wanted the last of it. Yeah, yeah I'll be up. <laughs> so I put my trainers on. So he's making a lot of noise. So I said, okay. So this kid wants to do it on the cameras. So he wants to dance on the cameras. That's what he wants, really. So I done something naughty. I, I shouldn't have done it because I should understand the dynamics. He's young still. So I knew the one thing that will wind him up because now I would want evidence from the cameras, in it? So he's come to me rather than I've come to him. So what I done was, I know I shouldn't have done it. I blew him a kiss. I went, <laughs> he went mad. He went absolutely, went to rush over. And they were holding him back. They've given him another kiss. I go, <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and, and so after my friend talk, spoke to me and he, he was saying like, come on, like, you're too old for this. We, we think like you wind up these young guys, like just talk to him. So I spoke to him. I'm so glad. I really like this kid as well. I spoke to him. So after anyway, we called. He was a bit like, when I went into his soul, it was a bit like, so I asked him, where would you like me to sit? To try to make him feel more comfortable. So he was like, yeah, there. So, so, so I'm listening to him. And so I said that, first and foremost is, can you get the watch back? He said, it's gone. I knew it was. That was an expensive watch. I know they gave it to someone that's gone. I knew that. So I asked him a question, why did you do it? He said that, look, all my life I've had nobody show me any love. People only use me because of what I do. And this same guy was using me as well. Yes, he has a nice watch. You always saw me with him. But what has he ever given me? He was stunting in front of me. So he's showing me all these things, but he's never bought. And I thought, you know what? He's so correct. He didn't give him the slice of the cake. He was just giving him crumbs. He knew that this guy didn't really show him any love because these kids weren't, weren't doing this to me. And he could. He's strong. He's stronger than me. <laughs> But they've never acted like this, but this guy has. He, he thought that he could manipulate them and it didn't work out for him in that way. So I realized that there's always two sides to every story, no matter how severe it looks. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's good just to observe mm -hmm. and to find out what the real reason behind that was. So anyway, eventually um, <clears throat> I moved on. I moved on from there. Brixton, they were giving me problems. Eventually I went to open conditions, more problems. It was good in the sense of, I'm not going to lie, all the stuff, they never bothered me at all. They was like, yeah, pal, yeah, do that, do that. You can do whatever you want to do. Like, they just left me alone. Oh, you're so polite. You're breath of fresh air. And I'm just thinking, I'm just being me. But then they called me to the probation and they said, um, you have somebody wanting to converse with you. And I'm thinking, who? What's the great mystery? Just tell me who it is. I saw this young lady, she came on the screen, she said, oh, hello, Dwayne. I'm thinking, um, excuse me, I'm not being rude, but who are you? 
She says, oh, um, we're national security. I'm thinking, oh man, like national security. Well, yeah, well, you've been flagged up as, so we're going to be, we're, um, we're your probation from now on. So for three and a half years, I've had them. And in that time as well, I had so many restrictions. For example, I, um, as you know already, I couldn't do any podcast. But even before that, like there was so many job opportunities that I lost out on because they had to go to my employees. So could you imagine if somebody came to you and said, we're national security and would you employ this guy? They're going to think, whoa, what's he done? Automatically. So there were so many, there were so many restrictions. There were so many things that were um, basically happening and it was difficult. At the end of it, eventually when um, <clears throat> they've all left now. So I'll see national security. I had to see a person from the home office every week. They um they assigned me when I was in DCAT a imam that went through the Quran with me. I weren't allowed inside um outside. I weren't allowed inside mosques anything. But now I've I've been cleared by them, so I'm not with national security no more. Not with any of them. And at the end, the last meeting I had with them, I said, "So where was the great major plan and the plots that I was supposed to be doing?" They said, "We're only doing our job." I said, "I understand that," but I said that. I'm not blaming you because she was okay. But what I'm actually saying <clears throat> is that many lives have been destroyed because of this, this kind of process as well. I don't think I deserve that. And I lost out a lot and I could have easily have given up. And what we call, we call it kind of like the Jean Valjean syndrome. So if you've read the book, Les Miserables, so it's a man that, you know, broke the window to feed his family then um, <clears throat> after that, he was, you know, he was incarcerated for, I think it was five or seven years, but he could never accept being incarcerated. So he always trying to escape to eventually done 19 years. He tried to change his life, but society wouldn't give him that opportunity for him to change. And then he became very bitter and enraged. And then he said, okay, because you're making me out to be the monster, I'll be the very same thing that you fear. So... He became that monster. And that's what we call the Jean Valjean syndrome. Do you see yourself in that story? <clears throat> um, not really, because I know that um the sky has no limit. And I've realized that and there is some good people. And I'll tell you the reasons why. Because at the time when I was <clears throat> the first opportunity I got, and it was part-time, was from Grapple Zone in Westminster Bridge Road. It's uh Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, so I do Jiu Jitsu. And they weren't scared. They were all about giving people second chances. And they said that, look, it's not much, but it can be something. You can work as a sales rep um, representative and also as a receptionist just to build up your profile and everything else. And I said, you know what? Thank you for giving me this chance, this opportunity. And they treated me no different from their team. They trusted me. Um, I now work, you, you know, I, I, they gave me the keys. I locked up everything is full trust. So they were, they believed in giving people second chances. Then I had, you know, I must admit again, and I have to mention him as well. I know that sometimes some people may dislike him, but young spray from RTM. Yeah, sure. Young spray. Yeah, please. He was always just phony, making sure that I'm okay. Is there anything that I can do for you? You know, and it was coming from a good place because there was nothing that I could give him. And then obviously the family, my friends, my wife, and this has been a massive influence in my life as well. It's my wife. How did you meet your wife? <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> do you know what? <laughs> did you get married in prison? Um, When I was in open conditions because they wouldn't allow us to. Mm -hmm. So how I met my wife as well, when I came out of isolation as well, I spoke to my brother. And my brother that's here <laughs> and i was like i was saying to him because it does isolation does do something to you and i was lonely i just wanted someone to talk to like a feminine presence does that make sense of course I just my to speak to her. And not be around men all the time and i said look no, you have some and he said look i got the perfect person for you she's bubbly she's intelligent 
I think you are a good match and the family loves her. You know, my father loves her, you know. Yes, yeah, son. I wanted one of my sons to marry her. <laughs> like, <you know? laughs> so it was, <clears throat> it was. And you have to also remember, she's she comes from an Italian background. She's Italian. And, you know, her family's got good occupations as well. They were very cautious her sister's a barrister and so at first you know they've seen people and they're thinking whoa what have you done <laughs> like yeah. you know there's nervousness they're thinking everybody would do the same though yeah, of course you would yeah. i can't i can't fool them yeah, for that but they're yeah. thinking oh my gosh you certainly you certainly bought this you know we told you to go to the zoo but not to bring the animal back <laughs> you know, you know that one of those. <laughs> so you know she was under a lot of pressure as well but she believed in it oh but what happens if he changes he can change because there is there is a lot of changes and even now i'm still finding time to adjust it's hard we've gone through our difficulties since being out as well where we nearly separated and things such as this it's difficult but i just the moments when I really needed her, she was there. She was like a rock for me. And I I can't, I can't disrespect that. It's just, it was, it was, it was, it was hard. And so, yeah, that's how we met. So we spoke, um, <clears throat> then we found compatibility. And then from there, uh, we, uh, we expressed to our family and friends what our intentions were. And then obviously I'm a Muslim, she embraced Islam. And we married. But now the problem was as well, they weren't recognizing it religiously. So we had to do the registry office and we done that as well. So we've been, we've been married for three years. I would say, yeah, three years. See, when you spoke to the woman, Angela, and you spoke about fears, what was your biggest fear? I had a few, but losing the ones that I love. And I think it was, Time can be very cruel and time waits for no one. And as much as I was stuck in the past, people were moving on. My brothers and sisters were having children and they've got their own families. And I'm still seeing them as we're still young and we're, I'm, still, I'm still revisiting things that was long lost. And sometimes as well, um, I was upset with a lot of individuals as well, like even friends as well, thinking that they didn't do they didn't do what they said they were going to do when I was incarcerated. But now being outside, I understand that it weren't that they didn't have the intentions of doing it. Society doesn't sometimes give you that chance, that opportunity. Things are moving so fast as well. Everyone's treading water. Everyone's just trying to stay alive. Yeah, it's difficult. Yeah. And so now I understand that. And I'm trying to appeal this to the brothers that are incarcerated as well. Please don't sometimes don't be so quick to um, judge individuals as well that are outside as well because it is very hard when you know you have to pay council tax you have to pay all these kind of bills as well me and my wife as well we're, we're renting we we have to pay rent we have to do all these things as well it's hard out here especially if you're living a legitimate life and that's what we're doing what's the worst thing you've seen in prison um i think one of the worst things that i've actually seen when i was in solitary confinement I think, and I always remember this. I know I've said it so many times, but it was a guy and he's no friend of mine. He has racist tendencies, but his mother died. And so all he wanted to do was phone his family and have that conversation with his family. And the officer said, kick the door again. He's getting frustrated because he wanted to make the phone call and they wouldn't allow him to. And so he kicked it. He said, come on lads, let's suit up. And they beat him so much. I've, do you know when it almost became inhuman and he wet himself? And he beat a person so much that they wet themselves and they were laughing about it. And I remember some of the women officers as well, they were wiggling their little fingers because he, were, he weren't willing down. So they were laughing at him when they cut his clothes and so forth. And I think for me, psychologically, that always impacted on me. Like no matter how much you may dislike a human being as well though, but to subject him to that kind of treatment, it's not right. So I think that's what kind of impacted on me as well, mm. that I saw in prison. Degrading someone? Yeah, so bad. So after nearly <coughs> spending 30 years in prison, when you got your lib date, like, what was that feeling, knowing you were going to get released? Oh, there, was, there was mixed emotions. 
and it was so nice as well. Even the send off, like from the guys that were in the open, it's like everybody knew about it. Because it's been a long time, like, you know, there's, I got along with so many people. So even I had so many bags and half the wing was carrying my bags <laughs> and wishing me of all different races, nationalities. And it was this, it was amazing. Surprised all the fucking screws weren't carrying your bags just to get you to go, man. <laughs> no, no. Thank fuck he's gone for safe. No, no, no. But, cause no, <laughs> no, no after that, you changed, but... No, because <laughs> even then, the, um, do you know the officers done? Mm -hmm. They stood up and they hugged me. They actually hugged me. And they said, we know you're going to do great things out there. That's what they said to me. And How I was shocked. How did that make you feel? Um, How did that make you feel to be anti authority, basically hating them, basically don't care if they lived or died, to then getting hugs and getting support to show? Because you could have had that at the start as well. Like I say, it's just lack of education to understand people, mm -hmm. and you're going to get good and bad everywhere, anywhere in life. So, 100%. how do, how was that feeling for you to be then feeling love and feeling? Do you know what this is? Because it's a warm feeling. Don't get me wrong; it's a bit gay. You feel kind of something changes in you where you don't have that persona of anger frustration violence then you feel sensitive and you try and understand things but how was that for you to the man the shit that you've done in the system to um, then be getting that love do you know what i'm still processing it because i was shocked yeah i wasn't expecting it so you know it's just one of those it was so many officers came out to say goodbye to me as well and it was just like that's why we say especially in islam as well that man plans but god is the best of planners Mm -hmm. because you just never know and it was just yeah it was a it was a good feeling though to know that people are actually seeing that i am trying and it's not just the other day this has taken years so sometimes when people are saying that yeah i don't really trust him it feels a bit no this has been this has been years when was the last time that i i had a physical altercation with anyone was from 2011 they have to also understand that <laughs> so it's taken many many years it's no no deal ever no deal want a lot remember a lot of people are envious in this world because they don't make changes so a lot of people will not want to see you've changed because they're stuck in their ways even though you've been in for nearly 30 years people are still in a, it's like a prison sentence for people yeah. on the streets they ain't yeah. done fuck all You've not really met, so you, obviously you've missed your freedom, but they've a lot of people are still in the same area, yeah. talking the same <laughs> shit, living the same life, and that's down to them, but it's all they know as well, and mm -hmm. things don't really change that much. Obviously, things move on, but when you get out, you, are you ever scared now that the old Dwayne comes back? Because he's always going to be there. That inside, internal, whatever it is, it's, you've just controlled that, mm -hmm. which is a beautiful thing, but do you ever get scared that you could fucking unleash it again? No, I get scared that I can be misconstrued and be placed back into prison because remember, my foot is not secure, especially when you have a life sentence. But on regards to, no, I don't. I'll tell you why. When you've lived the lifestyle that we've lived, you need to, you need to have a certain mindset. I don't have that in me anymore. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't have that, that kind of ruthlessness anymore. I just don't have it in me. And somebody said that one day it will happen to you. Either you would either die or it will happen to you where you just don't have that in you. It won't work for me, though. No. So, yeah. Do you ever worry about old retaliation? No, I don't. Because, look, it's in God's hands. And not only that as well, as well, it's, it's a whole different world out here now. And I'm a true believer as well about removing yourself. I don't live around here. I'm where we live is a leafy area for me and my wife. Um, it's yeah, it's quiet, and that's how I like it. And I only converse with those that I believe that are of some benefits. And you know, it's nice as well because <clears throat> do you know when you've known, like for example, I can only I'm going to speak about this individual because I know I know him personally, like Lou. I've known him my whole entire life. I've seen the trials and tribulations that he's gone through. And it's nice to actually see that somebody who I personally know has made changes and adjustments in his life as well. It's so nice. 
we came from a we came from an era. I'm older than him. We came from an era that was kind of like passed down. It's like it was like a gladiatorial contest, and those that stood out. And he was my neighbor. His father was my uncle. He looked after me. He always made sure that I was okay. Always. All the prison time that I'd done, sending me money before he was incarcerated himself and uh, making sure that I was always okay or my family was okay. I saw, you know, and it's nice to see the, the changes and what they're trying to do, to, you know, for the community. And that's all I'm trying to do as well. What's your biggest regret? The lives I've destroyed. Because I'm going to be honest with you. I've encouraged so many people in my life as well. There's lots of young people that looked up to me as well. And I set the wrong example, but I was young myself. So that is, that's something that's going to haunt me for the rest of my life. But it is, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes I sit there. My wife says, are you okay? I just sit there. I'm just like, it's hard. It's difficult. I know that that's a cross that I have to bear. But yeah. How hard does change? It's very hard was difficult but I had to look within myself what do I want out of life do I want to continue to be a victim of circumstances or do I want to create my own kind of history and my own kind of future God has been kind to me as well he's given me a beautiful family he's given me a beautiful wife and everything we've been through you know we've been through a lot we've been through so many trials and tribulations she could have easily have walked away but she never is that the first time you felt love and, and, what well, felt love in the sense of my family's always shown me love. Yeah, from outside. But outside, that. definitely hundred and one percent genuine love. She didn't know who I was. She didn't care about that. If I was still up to any of those things, she'll be gone. She's not any way criminally involved in anything. So she just saw me as a person, as a human being. And she tells me what my failures are as well. That's what I like about her as well. She'll tell me where I'm going wrong. Where other people in the past have encouraged me or say, yeah, but just do this, yeah, you can do that. No, she will tell me. When are you at your happiest? Well, when I'm with her, I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest. Um, we went through a difficult period when I came out because it was hard for us to adjust. And when I went with her, I felt lost. I thought I lost everything. This one, I know that she was the right person for me. When are you lost? I think sometimes when I have flashbacks, I know it might sound strange, but sometimes I could be sitting there and a moment can, a moment can just occur where I think back of like a time where I didn't get my food today or they've done something to my food or you know, they've laughed at the death of a family member when I've been told the bad news and I can't do anything about it. Or something's happened to my family member and I've received a letter. <clears throat> so sometimes those things, but it's a part of life. We all go through our trials and tribulations. Where do you go forward for the future? Yeah, so I just want to, I just want to help. <clears throat> See, one of the promises that I actually made before I left, especially solitary confinement as well. Some of the guys asked me as well, you have a flattering tongue. <laughs> they always used to make a joke. And and they say that, please be a voice for us. So I always said that I wanted to be a voice for the voiceless. So I want to help build a better system in place for those that are incarcerated. Not only for them, but also to help members of the public as well. So these individuals don't come out angry and bitter and thinking that society owes them everything and create more victims. So that's what I would like to do, but sometimes it's very difficult as well. Because what I've found since being out as well, it's like an old boys club. It's like the privileged few. And then that's it, or you're just a mascot, push you to the side. And not knowing that I need to survive as well. I'm trying to do something positive as well. Try to encourage, you know, encourage this goodness. Sometimes I just find that it's difficult, but we have patience because one thing that prison actually teaches us as well is patience. You wait for everything. <laughs> you wait for your food, you wait for visits, you wait for everything. So, What's your biggest life lesson that you've learned with all the traumas and tribulations you've went through? 
I think what Albert Einstein said, condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. So rather than just assuming, know the facts first. I think that's very important in life as well. Sometimes we can see that a person behaves a certain way. You say, I don't really like him, but you don't know what problems that person's going through in their lives as well. It's like once me and my brother had an argument, my brother that's there. And I said I was going to put him in a naughty corner, not knowing that he would probably put me in a naughty corner. <laughs> but, and he says that, but do you know what problems that everyone else is going through? And I weren't really thinking about that. I was just thinking about how I was feeling. And it's all true. Now being out, I'm seeing that. For anybody that's watching, that's maybe stuck in a life of trouble, what advice would you have for them? Mm, never give up. This is it. I understand that it's easily said than done, but believe me, never give up. It, it can, if you persevere, it will happen. Yeah, listen, for coming on today and telling your story, it's been mad, it's been a roller coaster, but it's unbelievable from the character that you were, and especially the people who I know who knew you personally, yeah. it's fucking night and day and it's a beautiful thing to see shout out to my brother Lewis Clark as well his yes. dad's out as well which is another amazing oh, thing you three please. all together it's fucking nice to see um, and probably definitely. a time you would have thought that would have never fucking happened never um, but would you like to finish up on anything else Twin? no I'd just like to say um, thank you very much for allowing me this platform this opportunity as well thank you and what's your social medias and stuff for people to get in contact? Listen, people watch this, maybe want to offer you a job or give you a helping hand because this is what it's all about. People can understand you mm. and not just believe what other people say. You, you can hear it from a horse's mouth and then people get about understanding, okay? The thing about people in the UK, we're good judges of character. Mm. Nothing really gets past us. Listen, we can all manipulate and bullshit, but people kind of know who's real and who's not. You're 100% real, man. You've been oh, lived you. that life. You've clearly made the changes. It's been a struggle. Listen, you've obviously got PTSD as well with the shit that you've seen, the shit that you've done, the shit that's happened to you. 100%. But for anybody, what's all your social media and links just in case people want to reach out? And Yeah, so my wife helps me with my Instagram because remember, I'm still behind times. So please forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, a, I'm a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. So um, it's Dwayne Patterson and um, mm. as the number three. So Dwayne, D-W-A-I-N-E and Patterson, P-A-T-T-E-R-S-O-N with the three. So for anybody that's wanting to help them, job or whatever, listen, by all means, get in contact. A lot of people may ask you questions, but you've lived that life. There's no reason why you should have been in prisons and schools and possibly a book can turn that into it because you've lived a very hectic, chaotic fucking life. And it's, listen, it's unbelievable the changes that you've made. And again, shout out to my boy, Louis. And yeah, uh, definitely. thanks for coming on today. And listen, I wish you nothing but the best for the future, my brother. Okay, thank you, my brother. God bless you, bro. Yes, and same to you. Yeah. Thank you.